57 days ago, in the dead of night, the worst environmental nightmare in U.S. history began. On a screen here and in homes across the country, we now see the live video of tens of thousands of barrels of oil billowing into the Gulf of Mexico every day. For years, the oil industry swore this could never happen. We were told the technology had advanced, that offshore drilling was safe. BP said they didn't think the rig would sink. It did. They said they could handle an Exxon Valdez size spill every day. They couldn't. BP said the spill was 1,000 barrels per day. It wasn't, and they knew it. Now, the other companies here today will contend that this was an isolated incident. They will say a similar disaster could never happen to them. And yet, it is this kind of blind faith, which is ironically the name of an actual rig in the Gulf, that has led to this kind of disaster. In preparation for this hearing, the committee reviewed the oil spill safety response plans for all of the companies here today. What we found was that these five companies have response plans that are virtually identical. The plans cite identical response capabilities and tout identical ineffective equipment. In some cases, they use the exact same words. We found that all of these companies, not just BP, made the exact same assurances. The covers of the five response plans are different colors, but the content is 90 percent identical. Like BP, three other companies include references to protecting walruses, which have not called the Gulf of Mexico home for three million years. Two other plants are such dead ringers for BPs that they list a phone number for the same long dead expert. The American people deserve oil safety plans that are ironclad and not boilerplate. We now know the oil industry and the government agency tasked with regulating them determined that there was a zero chance that this kind of undersea disaster could ever happen. When you believe that there is zero chance of a disaster happening, you do zero disaster planning. And the oil industry has invested nearly zero time and money into developing safety and response efforts. The oil companies before us today amassed nearly $289 billion in profits over the last three years. They spent $39 billion to explore for new oil and gas. Yet, the average investment in research and development for safety, accident prevention, and spill response was a paltry $20 million per year, less than one-tenth of one percent of their profits. The oil companies may think it's fine to produce carbon copies of their safety plans, but the American people expect and deserve more. It is time to expect more from the oil industry, and that needs to start today. First, Congress must ensure that there is unlimited liability for oil spills by oil companies. While we try to cap this well, we must lift the cap on oil industry liability. Second, Congress must also enact wide-ranging safety reforms for offshore drilling. If oil companies are going to pursue ultra-deep drilling, we must ensure that it is ultra-safe and that companies can respond 
ultra fast. Third, the free ride is over. Oil companies need to pay their fair share to drill on public land. Right now, every single one of the companies here today and dozens of others are drilling for free in the Gulf of Mexico on leases that will cost American taxpayers more than $50 billion in lost royalties. And fourth, we must ensure that new technologies are developed for capping wells, boosting safety, and cleaning up spills. I will soon introduce the Oil SOS Act to ensure that we have 21st century technologies in place for 21st century drilling risks. And finally, America must move to a safer, clean energy future so that we don't have to rely as much on oil to power our cars and our economy. The American people deserve answers from the oil industry, and I look forward to the testimony of our witnesses. I'd like now to recognize my distinguished colleague from Michigan, the ranking member of the subcommittee, the gentleman again from Michigan, Mr. Upton. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I thank you for calling this very important hearing. What happened on the Deepwater Horizon rig was truly a national tragedy. The loss of life was heartbreaking, and the environmental and economic damage that worsens by the day is gut-wrenching. As I've said many times before, it needs to be made crystal clear to all involved that the polluter will pay. The American taxpayer should not and will not be on the hook for the cost of this accident, both economic and environmental nor should consumers be punished with tax increases passed in the name of the BP spill that will only serve to add costs to hardworking Americans and further weaken our economy. We now have the opportunity to look BP America in the eye and demand that they fulfill their responsibility for the disaster in the Gulf and an important step is the creation of an escrow account that will ensure American taxpayers are not left holding the tab. In the wake of this tragedy, we must work together to find solutions that will protect consumers, taxpayers, and our national security. The cleanup has been too slow, way too slow, and too indecisive. We want answers, and we want them all. We have to work to ensure that a disaster like this never happens again. When that rig ex exploded and as millions of gallons of oil leak into the Gulf of Mexico, our economy and our national security posture is indeed weakened. I'm aware that each witness today was given a lengthy list of questions to answer in advance of the hearing. Many of these questions are constructive and relate to the problem at hand. Questions about rig safety, about worst case scenarios if there's another rig explosion, and questions about chemical disbursements, dispersants legitimate and constructive questions that will help us forge a solution-oriented policy. I am, however, disheartened to learn that a few of the questions have nothing to do with the disaster that we're trying to solve and serve the sole purpose of scoring political points and trying to advance an unrelated policy agenda that will raise taxes, eliminate American jobs, and leave consumers already struggling in this down economy with higher energy costs. Some of those questions are how much has your energy, how much has your company invested in the, the deployment of renewable alternative energy? What steps do you believe that the U.S. government and private industry should take to reduce the threat posed by climate change? Does your company su support an economy-wide cap on greenhouse gas emissions that includes transportation fuels? Would your company be able to pass any of the cost of purchasing emission allowances through its customers? Frankly, I would prefer to bring up the cap-and-trade bill again on the House floor because I'm convinced that this year it would fail rather than pass by the seven-vote margin that it did last summer. But that is not the issue at hand. Instead of taking time to talk about cap-and-tax or cap-and-trade, let's figure out how to cap the well. We're not here to discuss climate change, but rather what each of our witnesses think went wrong on the horizon rig and what policy change could be made to ensure that it never happens again. Let us not forget what's on the line here, jobs, the environment, our economy, and national security. Three years ago when BP was caught increasing the discharge into Lake Michigan, 
I joined with the Great Lakes Caucus and other colleagues on both sides of the aisle across the Great Lakes to beat back the attempt to increase pollution in our lake. We didn't take a partisan posture. We worked together to solve the problem. We need similar bipartisanship here today. The Gulf of Mexico accounts for almost a third of U.S. oil production. <coughs> if we eliminate that supply and our dependency on our, uh, if we eliminate that supply, the dependency on foreign oil will indeed go up. Saudi Arabia will be happy, Hugo Chavez, Ahmadinejad, they'll be popping champagne perhaps. But the American consumer will be remembering the good old days when gas was only $4 a gallon. The team of engineers tapped by Secretary Salazar to examine what went wrong on the Horizon rig recently wrote, quote, uh, quote, we believe the blowout was caused by a complex and highly improbable chain of human errors coupled with several equipment failures and was preventable. The petroleum industry will learn from this. It can and will do better. We should not be satisfied. Just wait for a second. We should not be satisfied until there are no deaths and no environmental impacts offshore, ever. However, we must understand that as with any human endeavor, there will always be risks, end quote. Let's learn from this awful mistake, fix the problem, clean up the gulf, and move forward to fixing our alien economy and create private sector jobs. Yield back my time. Great. Thank the gentleman. The chair recognizes the chairman of the full committee, the gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman. Chairman Markey, thank you for holding this hearing and for your tenacious work on this issue. You've been a true champion for transparency and accountability, and your efforts have kept Congress and the administration and the American people informed about the environmental disaster unfolding in the Gulf. Yesterday, Chairman Stupak and I released a letter describing a series of questionable decisions made by BP in the days before the blowout. Time after time, BP appears to have taken shortcuts that increased the risks of catastrophic blowout. One of the central question, questions for today's hearing is whether the other oil companies are any better prepared than BP. Last week, after receiving a request from Representative Weiner, the committee asked each of the five major oil companies for their oil spill response plans. On paper, they are very impressive. Each document uh, has uh, more than 500 pages long, and if I might, I'll hold up uh, the document that is the contingency plan. But what they show is that Exxon, Mobil, Chevron, ConocoPhillips, and Shell are no better prepared to deal with a major oil spill than BP. The same company, the response group, wrote the five plans and described them as cookie cutter plans. Much of the text is identical. Four of the plans discuss how to protect walruses, but there are no walruses in the Gulf of Mexico. We analyzed two key parts of the plans, the provisions for stopping a subsea blowout, like the one that is spewing oil across the Gulf, and their worst case scenarios. We found that none of the five oil companies has an adequate response plan. It's instructive to compare ExxonMobil's plan for controlling a subsea blowout with BP's plan. Here's what BP says in its plan. In the event the spill source cannot be controlled by the facility operator or remotely with a safety system, BP will activate the oil spill response plan and assemble a team of technical experts to respond to the situation. And here's what ExxonMobil says, and you can see the text on the screen. In the event the spill source cannot be controlled by the facility, facility operator or remotely with a safety system, ExxonMobil will activate the oil spill response and assemble a team of technical experts to respond to the situation. The plans are identical, and so are the plans for Chevron and ConocoPhillips. Shell did not give us a well-controlled contingency plan, but it says Shell would use the same strategies 
of top kills and junk shots that have already failed. Each of the five oil spill response plans also includes a section on responding to a worst case scenario involving an offshore exploratory will. On, on paper, these plans look reassuring. BP's plan says it can handle a spill of 250,000 barrels per day. Both Chevron and Shell say they can handle over 200,000 barrels per day, and Exxon says it can handle over 150,000 barrels per day. That is far more oil than is currently leaking into the Gulf from BP's well. But when you look at the details, it becomes evidence these plans are just paper exercises. BP failed miserably when confronted with a real leak, and one can only wonder whether ExxonMobil and the other companies would do any better. BP's plan says it contracted with the Marine Spill Response Corporation to provide equipment for a spill response. All the other companies rely on the same contractor. BP's plan says another contractor will organize its oil spill removal. Chevron, Shell, ExxonMobil use the same contractor. BP's plan relies on 22,000 gallons of dispersant stored in Kiln, Mississippi. Well, so do ExxonMobil and the other companies. I could go on, but I think you can get my point. These are cookie-cutter plans. ExxonMobil, Chevron, ConocoPhillips, and Shell are as unprepared as BP was, and that's a serious problem. In their testimony and responses to questions, the companies say they are different than BP. But when you examine their actual oil spill response plans and compare them to BP, it's hard to share their confidence. At this hearing, Congress needs to pass, Congress needs to review the evidence and pass new laws that put teeth into our regulatory system, but we cannot stop there. Our national energy policy is broken, we're addicted to oil, and this addiction is fouling our beaches, polluting our atmosphere, and undermining our national security. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We thank the Chairman. The Chair recognizes the ranking member of the full committee, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Barton. Thank you, um, <clears throat> Chairman Markey, and I appreciate you and Chairman Waxman holding this hearing to bring our major oil company executives before us and in doing so before the American people. I have a prepared statement I'm going to submit for the record, but I'm going to uh, speak extemporaneously. I've listened uh, with interest to uh, the opening statement of Chairman Markey and Chairman Waxman. I want to say that in terms of doing the investigation, I commend the majority staff, especially in the Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee that Mr. Stupak holds. Um, we are getting the facts assembled and putting them out in an open and transparent fashion so that the American people can understand uh, to the extent it's possible to understand exactly what happened. It's no question that uh, uh, the British Petroleum Oil Company, uh, who's the uh, owner and chief operator of the uh, rig that had the accident, is responsible for the accident. Um, it's also, as Mr. Waxman has pointed out, uh, the responsibility of our major oil companies to have adequate uh, contingency plans when things go wrong. So I'm not trying to whitewash the private sector in terms of uh, their responsibility for causing this problem. But I want to point out something that hasn't yet been pointed out. The five people most concerned about solving the problem are probably sitting before us today. ExxonMobil, Chevron, ConocoPhillips, Shell Oil, and BP America uh, have huge interest in getting it right and preventing it from ever being wrong again. If you add the market caps of those five companies, they would not equal uh, the market cap of some of the oil companies that are owned by sovereign nations, such as Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, uh, Republic of Mexico. So I would stipulate, Mr. Chairman, that while our uh, major oil companies have caused this problem, at least British Petroleum is the cause of this particular problem, I will also stipulate that the gentlemen before us are a big part of the solution. 
If the President of the United States has got a better idea of how to solve this problem right now, he can pick up the phone and tell P BP exactly what to do. Uh, it is a federal issue in terms of the mitigation plan, in terms of the cleanup plan. And if there's anybody from President Obama uh, on down who, ag who really knows the solution and can stop that oil from spilling right now, by golly, all they have to do is pick up the phone and tell them what to do. And the fact that they're not is simply because uh, the laws of nature and the laws of physics uh, don't respond to 30-second sound bites. Uh, you've got to know exactly what to do, and you've got to have the engineering and the technology available to do it. Uh, America needs the energy that's beneath the Gulf of Mexico and in the outer continental shelf. Thirty percent of our oil and gas is coming from the o OCS right now, and eighty percent of that is coming from what are called deep rigs. We have a depletion rate of existing production in this country, Mr. Chairman, of 30 to 40 percent. That means of the 8 million barrels of oil and gas that we're producing per day, of oil we're producing per day, next year we're only going to be able to produce about 5.5 or 6 million. You've got to replace that energy. And since we have drilled millions of wells onshore since 1896 or since 1870s in Pennsylvania, uh, the fact of the matter is if you're going to find significant oil reserves in the continental United States, they're going to be in the outer continental shelf. So we need that energy. Now, I agree with Chairman Waxman that having a 500-page document that's a cookie-cutter approach to what, to what to do when you have a problem is not an answer. It's not an answer. You can't have a contingency plan that says cross your fingers and hope the blowout preventer works. And that was a contingency plan. We haven't had a major accident in the OCS in 50 years. Everybody deci had decided that these blowout preventers are so good and so effective that it, all you had to do was push that magic button if all else failed and it would work. Well, they pushed the magic button on the, B on the BP rig and it didn't work. So Chairman Waxman's right. We need more than a cookie cutter contingency plan. But where I disagree, or I think I disagree with Chairman Waxman, the Chairman Markey, is that the gentlemen before us have the wherewithal, and the expertise, and they certainly have the incentive to put that plan together. Now, I don't know what the answers are. Maybe we need a full-time safety inspector on these rigs. Maybe we need a real-time data center somewhere that all the, all the drilling information goes to a central data point where there's somebody in charge of safety that looks at it. It does appear that if people had been looking for the problem that we now know happened, the data was there to tell them what to do. But they weren't looking for that. This rig was 40 days behind schedule and millions of dollars over schedule, and there was a lot of pressure to finish the job. And there was nobody on that rig whose job was to make sure that they made the safe decision. And so when you start making decision after decision after decision that is not in and of itself a bad decision but cumulatively minimize safety, eventually you reach a critical mass and you have an accident that happened. So our job, Mr. Chairman, is the watchdogs for the American people are to, one, get the facts on the table, two, listen to people who have possible solutions, Three, if there's a federal issue and a federal role, let's do it. But when you take a patient to the emergency room, the solution is not normally to kill the patient. The solution is to stabilize the patient, determine what needs to be done to save the patient, and then implement that strategy. And I will stipulate, Mr. Chairman, America needs the energy beneath the outer continental shelf off the coast of the United States of America and the five men before us who represent five of the largest privately owned oil companies in the world, while they are part of the problem, they are a big part of the solution. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We thank the gentleman uh, from Texas. The chair now recognizes the uh, chairman of the Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee, the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Stupak. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you. And Thank you to Mr. Waxman for holding this important hearing and for your leadership on the Gulf oil spill. On the Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee, we've been investigating the actions of BP. 
This hearing is important because it provides the committee a chance to examine the practices of the other major oil companies. It could be said that BP is the one bad apple in the bunch, but unfortunately, they appear to have plenty of company. Exxon and other oil companies are just as unprepared to respond to a major oil spill in the Gulf as BP. I've been examining the oil spill response plan of ExxonMobil, the largest oil company in the United States. This document, as Mr. Waxman showed us, is over 500 pages long. In many respects, it is virtually indistinguishable from BP's response plan and response plans of the other major oil companies. At this time, Mr. Chairman, I'd ask unanimous consent that the response plans of the major oil companies be made part of the record. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. There is one major difference between ExxonMobil's plan and the other response plan. The section dealing with the media. BP, Shell, ConocoPhillips, and Chevron have plans with short media relations sections. ExxonMobil has an entire 40-page appendix devoted to how to respond to the press. The media section in the ExxonMobil plan directs public affairs personnel to, as you can see on display, maintain on-camera skill proficiency. It also explains that communications which convey care and concern for the situation and provide relevant factual information are an integral part of ExxonMobil's emergency response. It sets up a four-tiered system who can respond to media inquiries. The highest level, Category D, dictates special treatment for questions about global warming and the Exxon Valdez. The ExxonMobil plan contains 13 pre-drafted press releases for almost any occasion. Give it a minute here. There is a fully drafted press release for an accident involving ExxonMobil facility. If the injury occurs off-site, there's a separate press release for that. Six of the stockpiled press releases are ready to express they deeply regret an outcome, while two or more press releases stand ready to express that ExxonMobil is deeply saddened. The media section also contains a topic guide with talking points on over 65 issues. In five different places, the plan directs the public affairs agents to say, quote, we comply with all applicable laws and regulations and apply reasonable standards where laws and regulations do not exist. If a public affairs officer is asked about criminal charges, the plan instructs them to say, we, we believe that there are no grounds for such charges. This was clearly an accident, and we are working to respond to the immediate needs of the incident. That talking point is ready to go before a hypothetical incident even occurs, before ExxonMobil could have any idea whether it was actually an accident or if there are any grounds for criminal charges. In short, ExxonMobil has meticulously anticipated virtually every conversation that, com that the company might need to have with the media in the days following an oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. My problem is that ExxonMobil has given far less attention to actually controlling a spill. While ExxonMobil has 40 pages on its media response strategy, its plan for resource protection is only five pages long, and its plan for oil removal is just nine pages long. We've all seen the horrible images of pelicans and other wildlife coated in oil from the recent spill. ExxonMobil's plan appears to be more concerned about public perception than wildlife protection, given the fact that their media plan is five times longer than its plan for protecting wildlife. And the can, pre-drafted, deeply saddened press release rings hollow with the loss of the 11 people who died on the Deepwater Horizon rig. ExxonMobil's plan is a perfect metaphor for what's go going wrong in the Gulf today. The oil company response plans are great for public relations. They allow the oil company to say we have a 500-page plan that shows they're prepared for any contingency. But these plans are virtually worthless when a spill actually occurs. And that's exactly the kind of misplaced priorities that has led to this disaster. I yield back to balance my time. Okay. We thank the gentleman. The chair now recognizes the ranking member of the Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Burgess. Well, and I thank the chairman. And I do have to wonder what any of us expect to achieve with this hearing today. I know what the folks at home are 
saying and, and thinking they want the flow of that well stopped. They want it stopped today, but it continues to leak. And I don't think anyone sitting here behind the dais or at the witness table today is going to tell us how to turn that flow off today. You know, the majority did not call this hearing to talk about meaningful solutions to shutting off that flow in the Gulf today because this situation really presents itself too great an opportunity to give some members of this committee the impetus for passing even more regulations. And likely there will also be the opportunity to increase energy taxes that Americans will pay into the foreseeable future under the guise of clean energy or climate change legislation. The President's Chief of Staff, Rahm Emanuel, spelled out the Democratic strategy for national energy policy best when he announced, you never want to let a serious crisis go to waste. And this is a serious crisis. But in some ways, Mr. Chairman, this committee undermines its own credibility when it capitalizes on a tragedy. And this is a tragedy. Eleven lives were lost. When we capitalize on a tragedy to push forward with a political agenda, now, I hope the majority members proved me wrong, and I hope that during this hearing, the members of this committee will have a laser-like focus on trying to discern how we stop this leak, because that's really all that matters right now. That's all that matters to the fishermen, to the shrimpers, and the individuals whose families and livelihoods have been put on hold while this well continues to spill into the Gulf of Mexico. Not how much we spend in the future on solar and wind technology, both of which I support, not how much we invest in nuclear technology, as clean as that may be, and certainly now how much this Congress intends to cripple the American economy even further than it already has with job-killing legislation. We've had those debates. We're going to have those debates in the future. But today, today, let's keep the focus where it belongs. And it's pretty simple. Plug the well, stop the spill, clean the gulf. So, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to respectfully request, I know you've submitted a list of questions that you want the witnesses to answer. I'm going to ask them to include in their opening remarks how, what ideas they have that will stop the leak, because that's really the question that we want answered today. If this hearing is not about stopping the leak, then why are we here? In the alternative, if the witnesses today really don't have an answer to that question, then respectfully one might suggest that this committee postpone the hearing until we have the witnesses in front of us who can answer that question. Finally, I believe the majority is looking at crafting legislation in response to the spill. And I'm concerned that this tragedy will leave Congress to do what it so often does and rush into writing legislation and with really no thought to what the consequences down the road will be. A week ago, the Committee on Oversight and Investigations had a subcommittee field hearing in Louisiana. And we heard testimony, and it was pretty tough testimony from two of the widows of two women who'd lost husbands on the Deepwater Horizon. Both widows stated unequivocally that they believed that the current regulatory requirements for offshore drilling are more than sufficient to keep the men and women working on those offshore rigs safe. The question then becomes in whether the regulations are being properly enforced. Mrs. Natalie Rashto told our committee, quote, after all of the safety schools, meetings, fire drills, and safety regulations, I just knew he was safe. We need to focus on making safety the most important priority, not to focus on making more safety regulations, but on ways to effectively implement and use the ones already in place." Close quote. Ms. Courtney Kemp followed with her statement, quote, I'm not here today to suggest that Congress implement more safety regulations, but rather to encourage you to hold companies accountable for safety regulations that are already in place and merely neglected." Close quote. And Ms. Kemp went on to say that offshore drilling accounts for 75 to 80 percent of all of the jobs in her little town in Louisiana. She said that less offshore drilling would devastate the local economies of not only coastal Louisiana, but also the economies of other Gulf Coast communities who rely on offshore drilling and oil rig jobs. Every job on the rig is responsible for four to five jobs onshore. When all of this is said and done, we need to find out why the agencies, why our federal agencies charged with enforcing safety regulations appeared to feel as if that job was unimportant. 
We need to find out why they were asleep at the switch. And certainly we need to hold any party accountable at the federal level that skirted safety measures. But first, we must stop the leak. Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back the balance of my time. We thank the chairman. The chair recognizes uh, the chairman emeritus of the committee, the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Dingell. For holding this hearing, I have a splendid statement, which I'm sure everyone will enjoy reading. And in order to save the time of the committee, I ask unanimous consent to insert it into the record. Without objection, so ordered. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Doyle. Mr. Chairman, thank you for convening this hearing today to examine the impacts of our nation's dependence on oil and the safety of drilling operations. We're 57 days into this environmental and economic tragedy, and the response effort is ongoing. We've learned that this Gulf oil spill is, in fact, the largest in U.S. history. New estimates show that unlike BP's previous claim of 5,000 barrels leaking into the Gulf each day, it's more likely about 40,000 barrels are leaking into the Gulf each day, but no one really knows. As such, President Obama has issued a moratorium on all 33 of the deep water drilling rigs in the Gulf of Mexico for six months or until the completion of the Presidential Commission investigating the spill. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration has told us about the inability of the administration to handle an additional concurrent oil spill at this time, and as hurricane season begins, with conditions rife with potential for disastrous storms, I believe the administration is taking the proper steps to avoid an even more catastrophic event. In fact, recent events all over the country merit the need for a serious review of safety practices in the entire oil and gas industry. Just this weekend, Chevron spilled as much as 500 barrels of oil into a stream in Utah, and then the last few weeks, the Marcellus Shell has seen two different blowouts in natural gas wells, one in West Virginia and one in my home state of Pennsylvania. In the blowout in Pennsylvania, the blowout preventer failed, allowing natural gas and fracking fluid to spew from the gushing well for over 16 hours, while the crew with the skills to cap it had to be flown in from Texas. Once they arrived, it only took them an hour to cap the well. In West Virginia, the gas explosion caused seven workers to be injured and flames burned for days before it was brought under control. Our growing energy demands require that we will continue to use natural resources under our land and sea. But there is simply no reason we should continue to extract our natural resources in a hegemonic and voracious style. The oil reservoirs in the Gulf of Mexico aren't going anywhere. The natural gas in the Marcella shell isn't going anywhere. I think it's time we take a step back and explore how to do this better and safer and more efficiently. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back my time. We thank the gentleman. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Shimkus. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, just a question. If we waive opening statement, or will we get the additional minutes for questions? Yeah, that, that is correct. Uh, I'll waive my, my opening statement, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman waives his opening statement. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Shattuck. Mr. Chairman, I similarly will, will waive my opening statement. The gentleman waives his opening statement. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Blount. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Sullivan. I waive my opening statement too. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Griffith. I'd like to thank the chairman and ranking member for calling this important hearing today and the witnesses for taking time to come before our subcommittee to discuss drilling in our current and future energy portfolio. Our number one priority must be stopping the flow of oil. That's certainly obvious. It's the job of this Congress to do whatever we can to aid the unified command in reaching this goal. This is a time of engineering and action. It's not a time to hastily put together knee-jerk energy policy that will jeopardize our energy and economic security in the future. It is imperative that this committee remember that the United States is part of the global energy economy and therefore all policies discussed must take into consideration that we are only 4 percent of the world's population. If we enact policies that drive drilling out of U.S. waters, these companies will not cease to drill. 
but we will cease to be able to ensure that oil and gas production is done in a safe and an environmentally friendly manner. As we await the outcome of the many investigations taking place, it is vital that we learn lessons from this incident so that we can keep our workers and environment safe while continuing to produce our valuable oil and gas resources. The moratorium put in place by this administration does not reflect the President's previous view, and this knee-jerk reaction to create a moratorium is simply a political expression, embryonic in nature, which has no place in a situation this serious. There are still many questions to be answered about what happened on Deepwater Horizon. However, I think we must also question the federal response. Government cannot facilitate a quick, effective response, and this event has been yet another example of that. To echo some of my colleagues, I think we must take a long, hard look at the federal response while also looking at the response of BP. This disjointed effort has not aided in helping to contain and end the spill. Thank you. Thank you for coming today, and I look forward to your testimony. Uh, I yield back. Mr. Chairman. Great. The gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Today's uh, hearing is entitled Drilling Down on America's Energy Future, Safety, Security and Clean Energy. And we have got, obviously, the five leaders of, the, of this industry. And I am very interested in what they are going to say in three respects. One, I think we need to ask, has the industry really shown accountability to make sure that the leaders are accountable for safety? So I will be interested in finding out how many people at British Petroleum have lost their jobs to date as a result of the most horrific environmental catastrophe in American history. I will be interested in that number. Number two, we will be interested in, num in the numbers from the leaders of the industry, what they are investing in an effort to develop technologies that can reduce the risk of offshore drilling. The numbers we have seen in our questions to the, to the witnesses so far are really quite astounding in how small they are. They all are less than one-tenth of one percent of their profits have been invested in clean energy and technology to try to reduce the risk of this type of disaster. That is less than one one-hundredth of a percent of their gross revenues. It is stunning to me if that is the facts, but we will like to ask the leaders if that is the case why they have exposed this country to this type of risk with such reduced investment. And third, it is appropriate to ask about the investment of the industry in clean energy. And the reason is, is that, and all of the, the leaders today will admit this, every single oil well we have ever drilled is an invisible oil spill. Because every single well we drill results in putting carbon dioxide in the air which goes into the atmosphere, which goes into solution in the oceans and have made the oceans 30 percent more acidic than they are today. They will be so acidic by the time my grandchild uh, leaves the planet, we won't have coral reefs anywhere on the planet. Every single oil well is an oil spill. So we will be interested in knowing what these leaders are bringing to the table in an effort to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels in an effort to find clean energy and prevent this type of environmental disaster. Unfortunately, it won't be the numbers we're looking for, but hopefully, we'll inspire some changes. Thank you. Great, gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Whitfield. Mr. Chairman, uh, I'll wait my opening statement. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Hall. Mr. Chairman, I can look back a lot better than I can look forward. And when I look back, I look to two entities that ought to be looked to. Uh, there have been suggestions that the federal government ought to play a more prominent role in the disaster, such as the taking over the process of capping the well. Well, <clears throat> there's two things you'd look at there. One is the financial statements of the two entities, the United States of America or British Petroleum, and I find British Petroleum in a lot better shape than the United States of America. It's theirs. I think it, initially we should have turned it over to British to cap their well. And after they cap their well, we'll tell them how much they owe everybody else. And I don't think this president knows any more about capping a well or going out and counting those birds or picking up little parts of the, of the waste than he knew about the Olympics. And I resent the fact that he's trying to blame some of this on Bush when Bush on 9-11, I don't recollect him ever accusing Clinton. I yield back my time. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from California, Ms. Matsui. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for calling today's hearing. I'd also like to thank our witnesses for appearing before us today. The families of those who lost their lives or had their livelihoods severely impacted by this disaster of unprecedented proportions deserve our unconditional support. Now as we continue to seek answers from BP and others about the cause of the accident, we must hold those responsible accountable. The first priority of BP must be to stop the leak from continuing to spread and to ensure the cleanup efforts are carried out to protect our coastal communities and the families whose livelihoods depend on it. And it is incumbent on all of us to make certain that this never happens again. The unfortunate part about this, Mr. Chairman, is that we have been here before. I remember more than 40 years ago when Union Oil's Platform A exploded off the coast of my home state. My concern is that today could be like 1969 all over again and that we are setting ourselves up for another four decades of more of the same. So the question I have today is, what has changed? What can the oil companies tell us today to assure us that this story is not simply repeating itself? Because what the Gulf region and the American people do not want to hear now are the same excuses that are employed decades ago about oil being our largest and most reliable energy option. In fact, the BP oil spill underscores the need to look beyond oil production and consumption and invest in cleaner alternatives that will create jobs and save our environment from harm. If we are to learn anything from this disaster, it is that we must continue to explore clean tech op alternatives to big oil. Today's hearing is a step in that direction. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back the balance of my time. Great. General Lady's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentle lady from California, Ms. Bono Mack. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank you for yielding me this time, and I uh, welcome the opportunity to hear from the witnesses today about our energy security and the ongoing oil spill operations in the Gulf. The companies represented by the witnesses at the table are at the forefront of energy resources development and growth, and your insights will be very important for how to ensure a spill of the current magnitude does never happen again. As we just heard from my co other colleague from California, many of us in, in California and Southern California certainly still recall the oil spill in Santa Barbara from 1969. To get a sense of the magnitude of what we're facing, administration scientists as of yesterday were estimating that BP's well could be spewing as much as four times that oil every day as we spilled during the entire Santa Barbara disaster. American lives have already been tragically lost, and we've yet to fully understand the environmental and economic impacts, so there is significant work ahead. Our priority for today and for the days ahead, as we've all said, must be to completely stop the leak. I hope our witnesses are willing to offer whatever assistance they can to ensure that that is our focus. I'm fairly certain it is what the American people want. As we sit here today, nearly two months have passed since the original Deepwater Horizon explosion. What have we seen in the interim? A number of charges against BP that still deserve answers, new government committees set up across agencies that are slowing crucial and critical response uh, decision making, and most importantly, the livelihoods of so many Gulf residents are being severely threatened. I will be interested to learn about the technologies that these companies have invested in to help protect against any future spill. Mr. Chairman, we as a nation ought to be devoting all of our resources to this disaster as the echoes of the Santa Barbara spill still haunt us dec decades later and as years of failed energy policies do as well, how this crisis is managed or mismanaged matters. We do not know the long-term consequences yet from the spill, but the devastation to the environment and the economy will be long-lasting and have national implications. I appreciate our witnesses being here today and I yield back uh, my time. Thank you. We thank the gentlelady. The chair recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. McNerney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for her today's hearing, and I want to uh, welcome the panelists here this morning. Uh, the explosion of the Deepwater Horizon and the resulting oil gush is a tragedy with terrible human consequences. Our thoughts and prayers are with the families of the victims and the hardworking Americans whose livelihoods and ways of life are threatened. You know, Americans are, th are shocked and saddened by what occurred, but their outrage is because there's no real plan to respond to a crisis of this magnitude. The technology that was supposed to fail safe failed badly. How could companies like BP have invested so many millions of dollars in technology for deep water drilling but failed 
to develop effective technologies to prevent this kind of gush. I want to know today what steps the industry is taking to ensure that the technologies designed to be fail-safe work as promised and what investments the industry is making in technologies that would allow for a far more effective response to the disaster. However, the real solution is to deliberately reduce our consumption of petroleum fuels so the demand for oil is technically manageable. I believe that this can be done in a way that improves our national economy, and I want to know what the executives sitting here in front of me today are going to do to, to achieve this goal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. We thank the gentleman. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Stearns. Good morning, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you uh, for having this hearing together with uh, Ranking Member Upton. Uh, the title of the hearing is Drilling Down on America's Energy Future, Safety, Security, and Clean Energy. I'm not sure uh, the title really is appropriate as well as uh, listening to some of these opening statements. The bottom line is all of us are frustrated here in Congress as well as obviously the Gulf Coast residents. We don't understand why BP didn't act more quickly. Uh, I ask uh, CEO Lamar McKay, uh, the question is how many barrels are coming out per day? He said 5,000. Then I read to him from his own report that he could handle up to 300,000 barrels a day 10 miles off the shore. So the question to him is why can't you handle 5,000? Well, obviously the 5,000 wasn't correct. At least many of us don't think it was correct. Uh, we now have an oil spill that's uh, seven times the Exxon Valdez, and yet there's no end in sight at this point. So the, really the purpose of this hearing is to ask these executives, these are people that are making the top salaries in the world, uh, to get to their spot. They have unusual uh, acumen, foresight, energy, business uh, awareness, and uh, obviously uh, have a lot of corporate uh, political savvy to get where they are. They wouldn't be here today, Mr. Chairman. So the question is, can each one of you in your heart of hearts say to us, that America is protected with all the oil rigs you have out there. We have almost 3,800 in the Gulf. Can you tell us today that we'll be safe, that America will be safe, and you have backup worst-case scenarios? Mr. McKay said he did, but he didn't. He didn't even tell us to write 5,000 barrels a day. Obviously, it was not that. So we need to hear from you under oath that you can, in a worst-case scenario, protect America's shores. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for, for holding the hearing, and I want to welcome our, our panelists today. States along the Gulf Coast are in the midst of dealing with this tragedy, and my thoughts and prayers go out to the families and the communities affected by this accident. For those of us who represent energy-producing areas, it's like a loss in the family, and I think we need to remember that. While we anxiously await a positive outcome on efforts to contain the spill, we also are beginning the process of thoroughly evaluating the answers to many questions we have on what went wrong and how to hold responsible parties accountable. As we consider how to approach these issues legislative, it's critical that we allow the facts to come to light and allow for thoughtful deliberation before making permanent statutory sweeping uh, changes that would end up taking us further from our goals of safe, responsible development of our natural resources. Quickly moving forward with the legislative proposals would have a profound effects and possibly negative consequences for America's production potential is not the path that Congress should take to rush to do anything uh, just to be doing something. While I understand there is uh, public leeriness to deep water production, I want to note that there is still a majority of the American people who support outer continental shelf drilling. I encourage administration to quickly develop and implement any necessary changes in the safety and procedural standards for deep water drilling and shallow water, by the way, because of the loss of jobs and domestic production we will see if this full six-month deep water drilling moratorium is the last thing uh, it continues. That's the last thing our recovering economy needs or our nation's energy needs. Um, also, it's also estimated 120,000 jobs could be lost as a result of this moratorium. Finally, I look forward to hearing what our panel plans to do to restore America's uh, public's trust in the oil and gas industry. There is a great record in the Gulf of Mexico, it's been said. The last time I can remember was the, uh, a well 
in the Gulf of Mexico is actually in the Bay of Campeche in 1979. So we have a, a good record. We need to find out why it didn't work and almost everything went wrong uh, with Horizon and why it is working in lots of other uh, uh, wells that are being driven, uh, drilled. Our country needs a strong, steady domestic supply of oil and gas and natural gas, and as we transition alternative energy supplies, we must not forget that as we legislate this response in the accident. And look forward to testimony again, Mr. Chairman. I yield back my time. Great. We thank the gentleman. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Blunt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for uh, holding this hearing. I have a prepared statement I'll put in the record. Let me summarize that a little bit, and, and first uh, by saying I'm glad to have these five individuals here who, as uh, Mr. Barton said, have so much at stake and so much potential to be part of this solution. Uh, I'm hopeful that we can uh, use this hearing today to understand better why our government uh, and British Petroleum uh, could have possibly been so poorly prepared for this disaster. Certainly people in the fishing industry, the tourism industry, uh, want answers to this problem and there's plenty of blame to go around. I don't think the administration or the, uh, the uh, government agency heads have done everything they should have done from being prepared uh, to prevention uh, to the response. Uh, incredibly, uh, seven weeks after the Deepwater uh, Horizon explosion, we're still lacking resources and containment. Uh, the booms, the skimmers, the things that uh, should have been readily available are still not apparently there in the ways we need them to go. Uh, weeks ago, I introduced, and uh, weeks now, I introduced legislation that would require ready access to the things necessary uh, to contain a problem if a problem uh, developed in the Gulf. We're learning more and more every day about the failings of both the industry and the government uh, and uh, the regulators leading up to the incident. However, our main focus today and in the next few weeks uh, needs to be to, to stop, uh, do what we can to stop this problem uh, and then to study the problem and see it uh, doesn't occur uh, again. I'm convinced that we can protect both our environment and our economy. Uh, as we continue in our pursuit of more independence from foreign oil, Congress and the administration should work to ensure that we can produce domestic oil and gas in, environment, in an environmentally sound manner. I'm afraid uh, that the moratorium that the administration announced against the wishes of Secretary Salazar's own technical advisors will cost thousands of jobs and ultimately uh, harm uh, consumers. It's obvious we need to hear from the panelists today I'm grateful they're here. It's also obvious that members of this committee want to speak and, and are speaking and are concerned uh, that this not happen again and we'd be better prepared to take advantage of our resources, not become the victim of our resources. And I yield back. We thank the gentleman. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from California, Ms. Capps. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I look forward to the testimony of our witnesses today. BP's Deepwater Horizon oil spill in the Gulf is an environmental disaster that has already created and still threatens profound human and economic harm. We all must do everything possible to clean up the damage from this incident and prevent future ones like it. This morning our subcommittee needs to hear from BP how the spill occurred and how it's going to make the people of the Gulf whole. And more broadly, we need to hear from the oil companies in general about how they're going to prevent spills in the future. Unfortunately, we can't stop drilling overnight. And these companies have the responsibility to do everything in their power to prevent future tragedies. Having seen the 1969 oil spill firsthand, I can tell you that spill response technology has hardly advanced in the past 40 years. Finally, we need to hear from each witness and their companies whether or not they are going to play a constructive role in transitioning our economy away from drilling and onto clean energy sources. The record to date is not impressive. They need to transition away from fossil fuels for the sake of our national security, our economy, and the, vir the, the environment. This could not be more apparent than it is today. Passing comprehensive energy and climate legislation is just what America needs to do to help grow our economy and to create jobs. Taxpayers don't need status quo energy policies that send billions overseas to hostile governments. We need a safer, a cleaner and a more economical approach to energy development, one that shifts us away from oil eventually and toward renewable sources that can't destroy our coastlines. Every day we delay, our economy grows weaker, our enemies grow stronger, and the planet 
becomes more polluted. It's time for real solutions that protect rather than endanger our coastal communities, our livelihoods, our way of life. I hope we can enact bipartisan climate and energy legislation this year, Mr. Chairman. I pledge to work with you to achieve this very important goal, and I yield back. Great. The gentlelady's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Pitts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding this hearing on America's energy future. The BP oil spill <clears throat> is a tragic event in the history of our country. Not only have li lives been lost, but an unknown amount of oil has been leaked into the ocean causing horrible effects, some of which we know now, some of which will take years to discover. First and foremost, the leakage of oil must be stopped. I think we all know this, but it bears repeating, and I hope our witnesses will tell us what they think must be done to stop the leak. Once this is done, it is imperative that we thoroughly understand what happened aboard Deepwater Horizon before, during, and after the explosion. We must know what caused this horrific event so that it never happens again. In the wake of this event, questions have not only arisen regarding the cause of the explosion and the leak, but also regarding the appropriateness of response from BP and the administration. I find it unfathomable that the President is just now meeting with top BP executives. In addition, it seems to me that the entire Federal response has been not only disjointed, but confusing and frustrating for those on the ground trying to bring relief. The moratorium announced last week is just another example of poor judgment without regard to the economic livelihood of the Gulf Coast region and millions of Americans who buy gas every day for their vehicles. As I've said, this is a tragic event. We need to make sure due diligence is done in investigating the causes and the appropriateness of response in the aftermath. However, we need to make sure the response of this body and the administration is prudent, one that still encourages our country's energy security and independence. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today, and I yield back. Great. Gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentle lady from California, Ms. Harmon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome to our witnesses. Uh, I have long argued, and so have others, that we must move away from dependence on foreign oil. Uh, we know the national security pitfalls of that dependence. We see that played out every single day in uh, what's going on in the Middle East. But we also now clearly see that there are environmental and economic pitfalls with our ongoing dependence on domestic oil. Uh, many of the Californians on this panel, including me, uh, staunchly oppose drilling offshore California. And I want to applaud our President uh, for making clear uh, that that will not happen. Uh, but it is also clear, as our witnesses know, uh, that California has an addiction to uh, one driver per car and that there, therefore, are uh, many refineries uh, located throughout the state, uh, four or five in my district alone. Uh, El Segundo, for example, is named for the second Chevron refinery in the state. And so all of you sitting here looking at us are saying, uh, well, hey, if you're not fixing this problem, uh, why are you blaming it all on us? I just want to point out the obvious that some other uh, members have uh, also addressed, which is that uh, uh, all the companies before us uh, have uh, in 2009 yearly profits amounting to more than $64 billion. Uh, you paid uh, $37 billion in dividends to your shareholders. You invested more than $9.5 billion in exploration, uh, but you invested far less in uh, renewable and alternative energy. You are energy companies. And so my urging would be, why not invest in energy products and energy technologies that are far safer, that will wean us from our dependence on oil, that will keep your profit level up for your shareholders, but that obviously will make America safer. And finally, let me just mention that our constituents are very smart. And one of them uh, approached me in San Pedro, California the other day and said, why don't we require energy companies that are drilling, especially deep wells, to drill a relief well alongside the original well. If it was drilled at the same time, it would be there if a catastrophe happened. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We thank the gentlelady. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Scalise. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I spent last Friday on Grand Isle assessing the damage and talking to local leaders 
who say they are still spending more time fighting the federal government and BP than they are fighting the oil. That is unacceptable, yet indicative of a serious lack of leadership and coordination coming from BP and the Obama administration. First and foremost, our focus, BP's focus, and the President's focus needs to be on plugging the well and using every resource available to protect our fragile marsh and seafood beds from being further inundated by the oil. BP, as the responsible party, needs to be held accountable, and I intend to do everything in my power to make sure that BP pays for the full cost of this disaster. But in order to improve the inadequate federal response, we need a clear chain of command that holds people accountable. The Oil Pollution Act of 1990 states the President shall ensure effective and immediate removal of a discharge. On numerous occasions, the President has said that from day one he's been on the ground and in charge. But if that's the case, where was the President when state and local officials waited nearly a month for approval on a plan to construct sand berms to protect our valuable marsh and prevent at least a dozen pelicans from dying? And why do boats continue to sit idle at the docks when our fishermen are constantly having to seek BP's approval to get boom or clean up our beaches? The delay of the sand burn plan is a prime example of the incompetent response to this disaster. While the administration drags their feet in Washington, millions of barrels of oil invade our wetlands, killing scores of wildlife and devastating Louisiana's fisheries. Quick action and leadership could have effectively limited the scope of this disaster. Instead, the President responded by making excuses and shifting blame. Frankly, I and people throughout Louisiana have had enough and are sick and tired of the excuses that we continue to be given by the President and BP. Instead of leading like the Commander-in-Chief, the President continues to act like a spectator in the stands. To add insult to injury, the President's now imposed a six-month ban on deep water drilling. Make no mistake, implementing this ban is like taking a jackhammer to the bedrock of the Louisiana economy. This devastating ban will cost my state alone at least 40,000 jobs and will leave our nation more dependent on Middle Eastern oils countries that don't like us. We must figure out what went wrong to prevent this type of disaster from happening again in the future. But the President is now exploiting our disaster as a political opportunity to advance his radical agenda that will kill more American jobs. We need answers and we need leadership by the President. Unfortunately, we have neither, and Louisiana's people and wildlife are paying the price. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Great. The gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentlelady from Wisconsin, Ms. Baldwin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this hearing today and calling this panel of witnesses before us. The catastrophe in the Gulf has shed new light on the operations of the oil industry. The safety and security measures that they have in place, the disaster plans they maintain, and their efforts to move us away from our dependence upon oil and towards developing and promoting the use of renewable energy sources. As has been noted, the companies that are represented before us today have produced record profits in recent years. Last year's aggregate profits for the five companies represented here today amount to $64 billion. Unfortunately, what appears to be missing amongst the dollar signs is corporate responsibility, an obligation to operate in an environmentally and socially responsible manner, to provide safe working environments, to be good neighbors, and to reduce environmental impacts. Generally, Companies claim that stewardship is part of their philosophy. I think each of the companies represented here today have made that representation. Yet, what we are beginning to find as this committee and its other subcommittees investigate this disaster is that rather than corporate responsibility, we may have before us a culture of corporate irresponsibility. We know that the results of letting companies operate under weak regulation um, they begin to believe that they are above the law, they ignore warning signs, they shortcut proper procedures, they fail to properly plan for a disaster, and they put profits above all else. And you know, a lot of what I'm observing in this sector could just as well have been said about what we saw on Wall Street with the financial collapse uh, uh, in the last uh, couple of years. Mr. Chairman, government and industry all have a role to play in preventing future environmental and economic disasters. And as lawmakers, we have a responsibility to our constituents, our nation, to those who have lost jobs, pensions, and health care, those who have lost their lives, to put an end to this recklessness and to hold bad actors accountable. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses about the roles they see their companies and the government playing in ensuring future disasters are prevented. I yield back the balance of my time. We thank the gentlelady. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Arkansas, Mr. Ross.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding today's hearing to discuss the safety and security of current offshore drilling practices and the future of energy production in our nation. Uh, in the wake of the worst oil spill in our nation's history, we must now learn from this disaster and reevaluate our operating methods and examine how oil will be a part of America's future energy policy. As oil prices and oil company profits have increased dramatically over the last decade, so has our nation's dependence on foreign oil, with the U.S. importing approximately 52 percent of the oil it consumed last year. While I believe that our policies must be broad enough to create energy from a variety of domestic sources, including domestic oil and natural gas, I also recognize the importance of thoughtful investments in biofuels, nuclear, hydropower, wind, solar, and clean coal technology. On day 57 of this disaster, with no end in sight, I am hopeful that the five companies testifying today can inform us of what went wrong, how this tragedy could have been prevented, and how the American people can have assurance that this will never happen again. I believe the administration and our government must do more <coughs> to hold these companies accountable for their drilling practices and ensure the most advanced technologies and safety procedures are in place. Once again, Mr. Chairman, thank you for holding this hearing, and I look forward to today's discussion. Great. We thank the gentleman. The chair uh, recognizes the gentleman from Vermont, Mr. Welsh. It's absolutely outrageous that we are here today. What happened in the Gulf was something that BP assured us would never, ever happen that it did happen, in fact, was foreseeable and inevitable. And why was that? Because at every turn, reckless disregard of safety procedures, corner cutting, and decisions that were made for money, not safety. Mr. Chairman, I want to take this opportunity to address the current crisis. As BP debates whether to issue a second quarter dividend on their annual $10 billion dividend, we have people in the Gulf Coast who need compensation. Responsible companies pay their obligations, then they pay dividends. Many in Congress have joined me in my call on BP to direct dividend funds to an escrow account to be available to deal with the heartache and the destruction of livelihoods in the Gulf Coast. BP has affirmed its intention to make good on its obligations. Now we ask that BP take financial steps consistent with its assurances. President Obama and 54 members of the U.S. Senate have called on the establishment of an independently administered $20 billion escrow fund. That would be available to cover cleanup costs. Mr. McKay, I further call on BP to deposit dividend funds into this escrow account so that the citizens of the Gulf and the taxpayers of this country can be assured that your company will meet its obligations. I yield back the balance of my time. Great. We thank the gentleman. The chair recognizes the gentleman from uh, Utah, Mr. Matheson. All right. well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing. Um, I know that for each witness here, your testimony highlights the way in which your company does business and how, uh, and also we're going to hear from BP how to conduct it itself in the events leading up to the Deepwater Horizon explosion on April 20th. You each will discuss your safety record and lessons learned from past disasters. Um, I think it's fair to say that none of your companies are immune from criticism and accidents can strike at any place at any time despite the safety measures that you will be touting today. As has been mentioned already on Friday night, the Chevron pipeline began leaking in Salt Lake City and before being shut off early Saturday morning had leaked somewhere around 33,000 gallons of oil down Red Butte Creek in northern Salt Lake City, which leads into the Jordan River, which empties into the Great Salt Lake. The Great Salt Lake is one of the most important estuaries for migrating birds in the West. Fortunately, current information indicates that oil has not hit the Great Salt Lake. And further, it's fortunate that the drinking water supply is protected and by most accounts, the oil has been contained. Now, our 33,000 gallons is a pittance comp when compared to the magnitude of the spill in the Gulf, and the impact on my city's economy will not be anywhere near what it is for the Gulf Coast residents. It further highlights for me the importance of federal government oversight of our energy infrastructure. This 
particular Chevron pipeline was last inspected in 2008. We need to find out what the results were of that inspection and if anything that inspection uh, gave any indication of the potential of this problem that occurred this past weekend. Right now, the purported cause of this spill is that a branch fell during a heavy windstorm, created an electric arc, which hit a metal fence post that was driven into the ground just inches from the pipeline. It raises some questions. Why was a fence post within inches of the pipeline? When the electricity arced through that fence post, it burned a hole in the pipeline. That is the latest explanation of what happened. We need to get answers to that. The last thing we need answers to is that apparently the monitoring equipment on the pipeline failed to indicate there was a leak. And the first time Chevron was aware of the leak was when the Salt Lake City Fire Department called them the next day. So we need to find out, number one, what was the result of the inspection in 2008? Number two, why was a fence post drilled within inches of the pipeline? Uh, number three, why did the monitoring equipment fail in terms of why the leak happened? Uh, I'm planning on working with the Department of Transportation, the EPA, and looking at these issues uh, to find out why this happened. And lastly, how we define what clean is in terms of the cleanup. I will acknowledge Chevron has taken responsibility. Chevron has indicated it will pay for the cleanup in Salt Lake. I appreciate that um, aggressive position they've taken to try to reach out the residents of Salt Lake City. Mr. Chairman, I'm glad you bear with me. I, I know this hearing is more about the BP uh, situation in the Gulf, but I thought this incident of the past weekend was worth mentioning this hearing to show that issues about energy infrastructure and safety can touch anywhere along the supply chain. It's important we keep that in mind. I'll yield back. We thank the gentleman. The chair recognizes the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Butterfield. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I think we are all saying the same thing. Uh, we you should have done more to prevent this unthinkable disaster. Uh, even though some may suggest that my home state of North Carolina uh, is not in harm's way, uh, the fact is we may be. Uh, we are not only angry about this bill, but we are scared to death uh, that our coastal area will be affected. Over the past 30 years, the oil industry has used some of the world's most advanced technologies to drill in deeper waters. The broad ingenuity that allowed them to drill miles under the ocean's floor has outpaced commitment to safety, and that is unacceptable. BP ignored a very simple rule. If you can't plug the hole, don't drill the well. What concerns me, Mr. Chairman, is whether BP's mistakes are unique to them or are indicative of industry-wide practices. Regardless, we must now ensure that adequate safety practices and cleanup plans are firmly in place. It was assumed that this type of disaster would never happen, but it did. I hope this tragic event illustrates the need for action. Many of us on this side of the aisle have advocated a fundamental overhaul to our energy policy, stressing a broad portfolio of energy sources and energy efficiency. This overhaul can be market driven if we apply a real cost to carbon and its effect on our economy, our quality of life, and our environment. This disaster demonstrates that we cannot delay enacting comprehensive energy and climate change legislation to diminish our dependence on oil, both foreign and domestic. Today's hearing uh, will provide unambiguous answers, I hope, on what to expect in the days, weeks, and years to come. For millions of people who face this nightmare, we must demand transparency and a clear assessment of the future. I thank the witnesses for being with us today, and let me join my good friend, Mr. Welch, in requesting uh, BP uh, to consent to an escrow fund that will provide a modest remedy for those who have been harmed. I say to the witnesses today, put it on the table. We must know it all. Thank you. I yield back. We thank the gentleman, and the chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Gonzalez. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm will we'll be very brief. I usually don't make opening statements, but I, I think I can read the minds of the witnesses, Mr. Chairman. I think they're all saying these, all these individuals are stating the obvious and the political, and you're absolutely right, but I think when we get into the questioning, it will be a, a whole different world. Uh, as far as the political, to be real honest with you, all those that uh, are blaming the President for not meeting with BP CEO immediately, uh, had the President done that, I assure you, today's statements would have been, what was the President thinking meeting with the BP executives at the outset without first visiting the areas or first meeting with the Coast Guard and first responders? That's what would have happened. What I'm hoping that we're going to achieve today is to hear from these witnesses. What are the energy needs of America? How are transportation fuels obviously based on 
oil and what we're going to do moving forward. The difference between deep and shallow uh, water uh, exploration and drilling and how we meet the immediate needs of, of our public, our constituents, the citizens of this country, and the fact that meeting those needs in the interim as we transition to something different can be done in a responsible fashion. We can meet the need and do it <coughs> responsibly and that they're not mutually exclusive. Thank you very much. I yield back. Okay, we thank uh, the gentleman from Texas. And uh, that completes the period for opening statements from all of the members of the uh, subcommittee. The chair does not see any other uh, members. I will first make a before we go to the witnesses, I will first make a unanimous consent that uh, uh, Chairman Stupak and Representatives Blackburn, Castor, Deget, Weiner, and Jackson Lee be permitted to question witnesses following questions by members of the subcommittee. Uh, without objection, the chair hears no objection from any of the members of the uh, of the uh, subcommittee, uh, so it is so ordered. Um, it is uh, the policy uh, to swear you in before uh, you testify. So I would ask each of you to please rise uh, and raise your right hands. Do you each solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record reflect that each of the witnesses responded in the affirmative. Now we turn uh, to our first witness, Mr. Rex Tillerson. Mr. Tillerson is the chairman and the chief executive officer of the Exxon Mobil Corporation. He is also a member of the Business Roundtable and the American Petroleum Institute. We welcome you, Mr. Tillerson. Please begin when you are ready. Thank you, Chairman Markey, uh, Ranking Member Upton, members of the subcommittee. Of the many issues on the energy agenda, none is more pressing than the accident and the spill unfolding in the Gulf of Mexico. As someone who has spent his entire career in the energy industry, it truly is deep, deeply saddening to see the loss of life, the damage to environmentally sensitive areas, the effect on the economic livelihoods and the loss of the public trust in the energy industry that has resulted. Clearly, this incident and the response will have important consequences for the environment, for the citizens and businesses of the Gulf Coast, and for our nation's energy policy. It is essential that we understand the events that led to this unprecedented accident and take corresponding steps to further reduce the likelihood of a similar event ever occurring again. An expert, impartial, and thorough approach to understanding what happened is crucial because this incident represents a dramatic departure from the industry norm in deep water drilling. Understanding the facts surrounding this incident is critical to informing the long-term policy and the operational response. We are eager to learn what occurred at this well that did not occur at the other 14,000 deep water wells that have been successfully drilled around the world. It is critical we understand exactly what happened in this case, both the drill well design and operating procedures and the execution of the drilling plans, which led to such severe consequences. We need to know if the level of risk taken went beyond the industry norms. Based on the industry's extensive experience, what we do know is when you properly design wells for the range of risk anticipated, follow established procedures, build in layers of redundancy, properly inspect and maintain equipment, train operators, conduct tests and drills, and focus on safe operations and risk management, tragic incidents like the one we are witnessing in the Gulf of Mexico today should not occur. For many, current events bring back memories of the 1989 Exxon Valdez tanker spill. That accident was the low point in ExxonMobil's history, but it was also a turning point. In the aftermath, we launched a full-scale, top-to-bottom review of our operations 
and implemented far-reaching actions that today guide every operating decision we make on a daily basis. An overriding commitment to safety excellence is embedded in everything we do, with a daily commitment by our employees and our contractors to a culture that nobody gets hurt. In the early 1990s, we began development of our Operations Integrity Management System, or OIMS, a rigorous regime of 11 separate elements that measures and mitigates safety, security, mitigates safety, security health, and environmental risk. Of OIMS is management leadership and accountability. This management system applies to every operation we undertake. It is our common global language for safety and accountability. And when we do have incidents, we seek to learn from them so that we continuously improve our performance and this system. It is a system which requires internal and external assessment of each business unit's progress towards complying with all of the 11 elements. With respect to drilling, ExxonMobil has drilled almost 8,000 wells worldwide over the last 10 years. Of these, 262 have been in deep water, including 35 in the Gulf of Mexico. The standards and requirements that operate within OIMS dictate our approach to drilling, as they do for all of our other operations. We have documented standards for equipment and well design. We utilize proprietary technology to predict pressures and model resource flow, and we carefully analyze the, uh, that information to both understand and reduce the risk. We ensure everyone on board the rig, contractors included, know their roles and responsibilities and that all operations must be in compliance with ExxonMobil's expectations and standards. And we test this knowledge through regular drills and exercises. Sticking to this system has required us to make some difficult decisions. We do not proceed with operations if we cannot do so safely. The American people have shown their support for deep water drilling, but they expect it to be done safely and in an environmentally sensitive way. They have supported it because they understand it is important. In the Gulf of Mexico, it accounts for about 24 percent of U.S. oil production. Oil and gas activity in the Gulf, including deep water drilling, accounts for approximately 170,000 direct and indirect jobs. Worldwide, deep water production is, est is estimated to equal in a few years the entire production of Saudi Arabia. And it is a vital part of an industry that supports more than 9 million full and part-time American jobs and adds $1 trillion to our gross domestic product. These facts show how critical it is that all industry participants have the trust of the American people. We can secure this trust if we take the time to learn what happened and develop our response appropriately to ensure that every participant acts responsibly, learns the right lessons, and upholds the high standards. The American people deserve nothing less. Thank you. We thank you, Mr. Tillerson. Our next witness is Mr. John Watson. Mr. Watson is the Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of the Chevron Corporation. He is a director and member of the Executive Committee of the American Petroleum Institute, Institute as well as a member of the National Petroleum Council. We welcome you, Mr. Watson. Thank you, Chairman Markey. If you could turn on your microphone and move it in a little closer, Mr. Watson. Thank you, Chairman Markey. Ranking Member Upton. Again, if you could move the microphone in Sorry. just a little bit closer. Okay. Very good. Um, uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Upton. My name is John Watson, and I do lead Chevron. As we meet today, the tragedy in the Gulf of Mexico does continue to unfold. Our thoughts are with the families who lost loved ones, uh, workers who were injured, and communities that are dealing with the economic and ecological damage. For Chevron, this tragedy is very personal. Our employees new people who died on the deep water horizon. More than 13,000 Chevron employees live and work in the Gulf region. We have a very personal stake in operating safely because it is our home too. For our industry, this is a humbling experience. 
The American people expect that the energy we need will be produced safely and reliably, and that did not happen here. This morning, I will focus my comments on what Chevron did immediately following the accident and why I believe deep water development can be done safely. After the Deepwater Horizon accident, Chevron provided its full uh, support to the response. We deployed experts to assist BP and advise the Coast Guard on marine transportation planning. We have also been working with communities and organizations across the Gulf region. We helped lead the Joint Industry Task Force, which made recommendations to the Department of the Interior to raise industry standards to an even higher level. A majority of these standards are already uh, embedded in Chevron's operations. Within hours, Chevron held safety stand downs on our rigs around the world to review drilling processes and procedures. We examined our blowout contingency plans and scrutinized our drilling and completion policies. We also stress the responsibility that every single Chevron employee and contractor has, and that is the authority to stop work immediately if they see anything unsafe. At Chevron, we reward people who exercise this authority. At Chevron, one goal overrides all others, making sure everyone goes home safe every day. We have multiple systems to prevent a tragedy like the Deepwater Horizon. Our drilling policies and procedures are rigorous. We require continuous training. We certify our drilling personnel to ensure they are qualified to manage unusual circumstances. And we verify that contractors have the skills to execute well control. Our internal review confirmed what our regular audits have told us. Chevron's deep water drilling and well control practices are safe and environmentally sound. Since our first year of deep water exploration in 1987, Chevron has successfully drilled 375 deep water wells around the world. But we know that we can always learn and improve. So we welcome any new standards and safeguards that improve safety and prevent future accidents. To that end, we must act quickly to implement the recommendations made by the Joint Industry Task Force to ensure that all companies are operating with the same high standards of safety and reliability. Chevron will accept any new standard and adopt new standards that it doesn't already apply. We must also expedite the work of two new industry task forces, one focused on subsea well control and the other on spill response and cleanup. We also committed to work with the President's Independent Commission. We will we'll contribute to improve safety in every way that we can. Now we must restore the country's confidence in deep water drilling. I believe the independent investigation will show that this tragedy was indeed preventable. This is not a trade off of energy for safety. I strongly believe that responsible deep water development must continue. America needs the energy, and we can produce that energy safely. Our nation would lose more than it has already lost if this accident becomes the basis for reversing the many benefits of offshore development. Today, production in the Gulf of Mexico accounts for 15 percent of our natural gas, 27 percent of our domestic oil supply. Gulf of Mexico production is also a foundation of local economies, providing significant jobs, economic development, and revenue. The Deepwater Horizon tragedy reinforces that all companies must operate with the same high standards of safety and reliability. It is clear that fa failure to do so does have dire consequences. Mr. Chairman, we must learn from this accident. We must make sure it never happens again. My commitment to you is that Chevron will do everything in its power to see that it doesn't. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Watson. Our next witness is Mr. James Mulva. Mr. Mulva is the Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of the ConocoPhillips Company. He is also a member of the National Petroleum Council uh, and has served as Chairman of the American Petroleum Institute. We welcome you, Mr. Mulva. Whenever you feel comfortable, please begin. Thank you, Chairman Markey. Ranking Member Upton and Committee Members, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you this morning, all of us at ConocoPhillips extend our condolences to the loved ones and friends of the 11 workers lost on Deepwater Horizon. Thoughts and prayers are also with those injured or have been impacted by this spill. The Deepwater Horizon incident is a matter of national urgency. As Americans, we have a long history of joining together in times of need. 
We then work to find solutions that are in our national interest. So in that spirit, and in support of the people along the Gulf Coast whose lives and livelihoods have been affected, ConocoPhillips is providing manpower, materials, and resources to the responders and the emergency personnel there. We will do so until the spill is contained and the affected areas have been restored. We are not in a position to know about what went wrong at the deep water horizon. The companies involved and the regulators certainly will do that. But as an industry, we must commit ourselves to learning lessons from this tragedy, ensuring that nothing like Deepwater Horizon ever happens again. So any necessary changes undertaken by Congress, the executive branch, and industry should be one element of a broader national energy policy. That's a policy that recognizes that we have a robust oil and gas industry that generates vital U.S. jobs as well as substantial state and federal revenue from tax and royalty payments, one that guarantees the security of the energy that drives our national economic well-being. It's also a policy that assures the safe, environmentally responsible production of all forms of energy, along with its wise use. These are essential to a healthy and to a growing economy. Another key element of a comprehensive energy policy should be federal action to address global climate change. As you are aware, ConocoPhillips supports the passage of a comprehensive federal law establishing a clear and transparent price for carbon. A federal legislative framework, at a minimum, must provide a program to manage transportation emissions, one that protects consumers while encouraging investment in lower carbon technologies. It also must address the energy intensive and trade exposed nature of our domestic refineries. It must create new legislative mechanisms specifically for regulating greenhouse gas emissions. This would be in place of the Clean Air, Clean Water, and Endangered Species Acts and other federal and state programs. It must recognize the essential role of natural gas in achieving a lower carbon energy future. Lastly, in order to achieve our national energy goals, U.S. energy policy must create supply diversity, promote technological innovation, encourage energy efficiency, and environmental stewardship. Today, our country is working toward an energy future featuring a broad portfolio of energy sources, and these will include renewable sources and cleaner fossil fuels, broader conservation, and new, more efficient energy technologies. Each of those approaches will provide a part of the long-term solution. So as a nation, we are on our way. We will get there, but it is going to take us some time. Until then, we must fulfill America's pressing energy needs, in short, providing fuel that enables people to travel, to work and back, moves goods around the world, powers the lighting, heat, electricity, and machinery in which our homes, factories, and hospitals depend and provides the fuel and fertilizer that enables us to feed a growing population. In doing this, even with strong growth in renewable sources, carbon-based fuels must keep carrying the energy load far into the future. And fortunately, we have natural gas. It's one of the most important domestic resources available for use by our country in reaching its climate and energy security objectives. It's clean, it's affordable, it's reliable, abundant, and available here at home. We believe that through a national spirit of shared commitment to a mutually beneficial outcome, America can achieve its energy goals. And as a company, ConocoPhillips is committed to doing so. So thank you very much for this opportunity. I look forward to responding to questions that you may have. Thank you, Mr. Mulva. Our next witness is Mr. Marvin Odom. Mr. Odom is the president of the Shell Oil Company. He is also on the board of the American Petroleum Institute. Uh, we welcome you. Mr. Odom, please begin when you are ready. Thank you, Chairman Markey, Ranking Member Upton, and members of the committee. I am Marvin Odom, President of Shell Oil Company. And I would like to begin by acknowledging the, current, the continuing situation in the Gulf of Mexico, which is on the minds of every American. All of us at Shell are deeply saddened by the Deepwater Horizon explosion and the aftermath a terrible tragedy for the families of those who lost their lives or were injured. 
How many of our employees and customers live along the Gulf Coast and feel that pain firsthand? Now, getting to the root cause of this incident is critical. Like you, we want to know what went wrong with this well and the execution of this well design. As a guest investigation findings are available, Shell will incorporate any learnings into our operations worldwide. Now, since the beginning, Shell has made experts, equipment, and facilities available to BP and the responders, including our Robert Training Center outside of New Orleans as a site for Unified Command. Now, we took immediate steps to reinforce the safety of our operations globally, including a review of operating practices, testing frequencies, and training protocols. And we remain confident in our expertise and procedures, and that comes from focus on five critical and integrated areas to ensure safe well design and drilling in the deep water. And those are our global standards, our rigorous training and certification of the engineers, a safety case, a safety case approach with our contractors to identify the risk and mitigate those risks, ensuring robust and multiple barriers in our wells, and 24-7 remote monitoring by skilled professionals who provide immediate support on critical issues such as well pressure changes. Now, safety and environmental protection are and always will be Shell's top priorities. We have welcomed the recommendations outlined in Secretary Salazar's May 27th report to the President and the June 8th notice to leaseholders. And many of these elements that were included are already aligned with our global practices and we will work to incorporate all of them. In the context of this tragedy, we acknowledge the reasons for the President's decision to pause deep water drilling, but it is not without consequences. Thousands of jobs lost and billions in lost wages and spending, and not only in the Gulf Coast, but also in places like Alaska. And this brings me to the topic that you asked us to speak about today, America's energy future. At Shell, we believe that population and economic growth will drive global energy demand to potentially double today's use by 2050, even with strong efficiency gains. Energy supply from all sources, oil and gas, nuclear, renewable, and others, will struggle to keep up with this demand. Environmental stresses will grow, making the transition to lower carbon economies even more urgent. Now, with this as a backdrop, it is clear the world needs a more sustainable energy system. Alternative and renewable energies could be 30 percent of the new energy mix by 2050. The scale and the massive infrastructure of the global energy system does mean that change takes time. At Shell, we believe our, our industry can best contribute by making more energy available, by reducing emissions, and by increasing our lower carbon energy share while generating jobs and doing so safely and responsibly. Natural gas is not a renewable, but it is abundant in the U.S. and a lower CO2 energy source. Increased natural gas for electricity is by far the quickest and least expensive route to cleaner air. Within a couple of years, Shell will be producing more gas than oil, and much of that in North America. Biofuels are also one of the best opportunities for reducing CO2 from transportation for at least the next 20 years. Now, Shell is the world's largest supplier of renewable blend fuels, and we are investing in lowest CO2 biofuels made from sugarcane ethanol through a $12 billion joint venture proposed for Brazil. Investments in technologies such as these are creating jobs. One out of every $5 spent in the U.S. supporting new energy jobs comes from investments made by our, energy, our industry, which already supports more than 9.2 million American jobs. We need to retain these jobs and create new ones to fuel the economy of the future. Society, government, and business must all do their part. Absence of a robust energy policy has been a disadvantage to this nation. Shell supports legislating a solution to energy and climate issues as a means to create secure, a secure U.S. energy future, to reduce dependence on imported oil, and to decrease greenhouse gas emissions. Now, this requires setting a price for carbon. But shying away from oil and gas development during the transition is not the answer. Oil and gas development is too important to the U.S. energy supplies and our economy to not safely and responsibly move forward. Shell stands ready and able with skilled people and state-of-the-art technology 
to continue meeting America's needs. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to addressing your questions. Thank you, Mr. Odom. And our final witness is Mr. Lamar McKay. Mr. McKay is the President and Chairman of BP America. Uh, Mr. McKay, uh, please uh, begin when you are ready. Thank you. Chairman Markey, Ranking Member Upton, members of the committee, my name is Lamar McKay and I am Chairman and President of BP America. Before addressing the main topic of today's hearing, I would like to reiterate the profound sorrow and regret that all of us at BP feel for the loss of life and the oil spill resulting from the Deepwater Horizon explosion and fire. This is very personal both to me and to BP. I am from Mississippi. I grew up in Mississippi. I spent summers on the Gulf Coast. Uh, most of my family is in New Orleans and I have most of my relatives and friends along the Gulf Coast. The Gulf Coast states have hosted BP and BP's heritage companies for decades. Thousands of our employees, contractors and their families call the Gulf Coast states home. This horrendous accident which killed 11 workers and injured 17 others has profoundly touched all of us. There's been, there's been tremendous shock that such an accident could have happened and great sorrow for the lives lost and the injuries sustained. I'd like to make one thing very clear. BP will not rest until the well is under control when we discover what happened and why in order to ensure that it never happens again. As a responsible party under the Oil Pollution Act of 1990, we will carry out our responsibilities to mitigate the environmental and economic impact of this accident. In fact, BP is going beyond obligations under OPA to agree to pay all legitimate claims for economic damages resulting from the spill. Now, while it's difficult to divert from the here and now, we cannot lose sight of the need to help shape the country's future energy and climate policy. BP is committed to working with the Congress and with a broad cross-section of energy producers, energy consumers, and other stakeholders to address the challenges of climate change in the context of increasing U.S. energy demand. We appreciate the opportunity to share our views on energy and climate policy as well as a chance to discuss the major role of natural gas that it can play in speeding emission reductions in the power sector, delivering the greatest reductions at the lowest cost for consumers using technology that is available today. BP advocates and has advocated for quite a time an all of the above approach to tackling climate change, enhancing U.S. energy security and meeting the nation's growing need for energy. We do support policies that encourage conservation, energy, energy efficiency and greater production of domestic energy, including alternatives, oil and gas, and nuclear. Our views on climate policy flow from the fact that a ton of carbon is a ton of carbon, whether it comes out of a tailpipe or a smokestack, and the belief that every ton should be treated the same. We support a national climate policy that creates a level playing field for all forms of energy that produce carbon emissions. We favor an economy-wide price for carbon based on fair and equitable application across all sectors. Market-based solutions like a cap and trade or linked fee are the best solutions to manage greenhouse gas emissions. Applied nationally, these would achieve maximum environmental effectiveness at reducing emissions, treat all energy consumers equitably, and facilitate investment in sustaining and creating jobs. We have long supported transitional incentives for alternatives to assist their development and accelerate their market entry. Additionally, we think natural gas holds great promise in becoming a larger component of the U.S. energy pool and can provide a critical down payment at delivering upon our carbon reduction goals. Now, I'd like to conclude by noting that while BP is in the midst of a crisis right now and we are prepared to be judged by our response to that crisis, we cannot lose sight of the future. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. McKay. Uh, that completes uh, the opening statements of our witnesses. We will now turn to questions by the subcommittee members. 
the Chair will recognize himself. As I mentioned in my opening statement, the Gulf of Mexico response plans for ExxonMobil, Chevron, ConocoPhillips and Shell are virtually identical to BP's and just as deficient. As you can see by looking at the covers of these five plants uh, on the screen and over my head, the pictures are the same for each plan. All that is changed is the color of the cover of the plan from each of the companies seated at the table. Mr. Tillerson, like BP on page 11.6 of your plan, ExxonMobil's Gulf of Mexico oil spill response plan lists walruses under sensitive biological and human resources. As I am sure you know, uh, there aren't any walruses in the Gulf of Mexico and there have not been for three million years. How can ExxonMobil have walruses? in their response plan for the Gulf of Mexico. Congressman Markey, those response plans incorporate a number of broad-based studies, marine mammal studies, many of which are part of the EIS and EIA statements that are put together by the MMS. And much of the response plan and what is contained in it is prescribed by regulation, including the models that are used to project different scenarios for oil spills, and many of the statements and representations that are in the plan. These are, these are regional oil spill response plans. They, How they can refer. walruses be in a response plan for the Gulf of Mexico? This is a re regional response plan that each of you had question. to put together. And it is unfortunate that walruses were included, and it is it is an embarrassment that they were included, but that is part of a larger marine mammal study that is used in, that's used in preparing regional response plans. Mr. Mulva, uh, your plan as well includes walruses. Uh, Mr. Watson, your plan has them on page 11.6. How do you respond to having walruses in your plan? Respond in, respond in a similar fashion. The plans are put together uh, in response to uh, guidelines from the Minerals Management Service. Do you agree that it is an embarrassment to have walruses in a response plan for the Gulf of Mexico, Certainly Mr. Watson? Certainly the Gulf of Mexico that is not appropriate. Mr. Mulva, do you agree it is an embarrassment to have it in a plan to respond to a crisis in the Gulf of Mexico? I agree it is not appropriate to include for that region. In, in, uh, in a in your response plan, Mr. Tillerson, as well uh, as uh, some of the other plans, including uh, ConocoPhillips, uh, there is a Dr. Lutz who is referred to as uh, an expert, a technical support person. Mr. Lutz died in 2005, four years before the plan was actually filed. Um, how, Mr. Tillerson, can you justify in a response plan having a person who has been dead for four years. Is that also an embarrassment? Well, it is, but let me point out that Dr. Lutz is part of the University of Miami's Marine Mammal Research Division, which has been an important resource for preparation of these plans for years. The fact that Dr. Lutz died in 2005 does not mean his work and the importance of his work died with him. There are many other individuals identified in the plan no, I appreciate or contact in I appreciate the event that, that we need expertise. It's 2010. And those numbers are all valid it's, that are in the plan. It's 2010. Uh, it, it just seems to me that when you include Dr. Lutz's phone number in uh, your plan for a response, uh, that you have not taken this responsibility seriously. Uh, Mr. Mulver, the same is true for you. Is it an embarrassment to ConocoPhillips to have uh, that uh, as part of your plan? Well, the plans need to be updated more frequently. What's important is the institution. That's who we refer to for support. Obviously, it, uh, it is embarrassing, but uh, we really look towards the institution and not necessarily the individual. It just seems to me that for each of your companies, the only technology you seem to be relying upon is a Xerox machine to put together your response plans. Uh, that there wasn't 
enough effort put together to ensure that in the Gulf, if a catastrophe occurred, that you would be able to respond. And you, Mr. McKay, uh, in the first week, uh, your company developed a document uh, that showed that your range of possibilities for uh, an accident was 1,000 to 14,000 barrels per day. And yet, your company continually in the first week lowballed the number and said that it was only 1,000 barrels per day. You are now estimating that it could be upwards of 40,000 barrels per day. Uh, and you are today capturing 15,000 barrels per day of, of uh, oil uh, from that gusher. Are you ready to apologize to the American people for getting that number so wrong, uh, having been so incompetent or deceptive to the American people uh, that proper preparations were not put in place because of BP's lowballing of the actual amount of oil that was going into the Gulf of Mexico. First, just to be clear, those are those were United, uh, sorry, Unified Area Command estimates. They were they came from the 5,000 barrels a day was an estimate done on April 26th by by NOAA. Our input into that on the 27th, which was after that, was a range of 1 to 14,000 barrels a day. And our estimate, best estimate was above 5,000 barrels a day, but the, the Unified Area Command estimate was 5,000 barrels a day. We stuck with that. Information has been gathered as uh, things have moved along, we, as we have gathered oil. This document that I have is, a, is BP confidential in the first week. It says 1,000 to 14,000. This is BP confidential. Right. The onus the burden, the responsibility is on your shoulders. You had the technology. You were able uh, through your expertise to make this determination. Uh, and I do believe that it is either deliberate deception or gross incompetence, uh, because ultimately the amount of boom, skimmers, cleanup of the beaches and marshes and rescue of birds and turtles, the capacity which you needed in order to uh, capture the oil coming out of that spill, um, testing for the health of the workers. It was all dependent upon how large the spill was. Are you ready to apologize for getting that number so grossly wrong that the capacity of Federal and State governments to put in place a response was delayed because you did not do the job. I, I will just uh, reiterate what Commandant Allen said, is that those were not BP estimates. Those were Unified Area Command estimates. We did provide that. They were your cameras at the bottom of the ocean. That is true. You and got we provided, it wrong, and we, Mr. McKay. I'm Your company got it wrong. BP got it wrong. We have provided every bit of data we have got into the Unified Area Command with government scientists and government MMS, NOAA, Coast Guard to help them understand what data we have. On the day, Mr. McKay, that you are ready to apologize. What is that? On the day that you are ready to apologize, that is the day that we can begin to move forward and put together the kinds of plans that make sure this never happens again. It was BP spill, but it was America's ocean. Well, we and are, we need you to admit that you knew or should have known very early on that this was not a spill of 1,000 or 5,000 barrels per day. They were your cameras, your technology, your expertise that the American people were relying upon, and you got it completely wrong. Either in order to limit your liability uh, or out of incompetence. But the ultimate impact on this uh, region of the country is profound uh, and will last for a generation. Please, one final chance, apologize for getting that number wrong. We, we are sorry for everything the Gulf Coast is going through. We are sorry for that and the spill. What I can say is we have provided every bit of data and information we have to the Unified Command, to the government, to every scientist that is working on this full time and from that, that day you are talking about. So we, we do not have the technology to measure that. That is still under evaluation. Now, I continue to believe that BP is still more interested in its liability than it is in the livability of the Gulf. 
And this hearing is just one further indication of that. My time has expired. Let me turn and uh, recognize the uh, gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Upton. Thank you. Uh, Mr. McKay, you indicated that BP is uh, looking to pay all legitimate damages. Uh, are you willing to put into an escrow account uh, enough money to pay for such uh, damages as might be expected? Well, we've been very, very clear from day one that we're, we, as a responsible party under Open 90, we are going to be responsible and living up to the obligations of Open 90. I cannot comment on whether there will be a fund set aside or not. We've made it clear that the company stands behind these commitments. Uh, we've got a strong balance sheet. We've got a strong company. We intend to stand behind those. I cannot commit today one way or the other on whether a fund would, would serve that uh, in, in furtherance. So that's a, a no at this point? I can't comment yes or no. Why not? I thought you, the buck stops there. We, we've, what we said is we're going to honor all legitimate claims, and we, the, the full company stands behind that. Have you asked uh, the, the federal government for any help that you've not received? Uh, not that I know of. What grade would you give the administration in its efforts to stop this bill? We've been cooperating in every way we, we know how with the administration. And a, B, C, D. I, I can't give a grade. We, this has been a unified command that we've been a participant in with many government agencies. Industry, uh, we've got 150 companies working on this. Uh, I can't comment on a grade of individual components of that. Uh, of the, uh, your counterparts that are at the table, have any of them, are you working with any of them to try and stop the the leak? Yes, all, all of these companies have been tremendously supportive in helping us. A uh, question for all of you. Uh, as you do drills, uh, drilling uh, across the world, uh, which country has the toughest regulations uh, that enforce those regulations? And, uh, what, and if that country gets an A, uh, where would you put the U.S. Uh, with the enforcement by the MMS? Mr. Tillerson. Well, I think the, the United States and then the North Sea countries have the most mature regulatory structure around offshore drilling activities because that's where it's taken place the longest. And I can tell you those standards then get taken to countries that do not have established uh, regular, regulatory structures, and the same standards are applied everywhere. So the same standards are in the Gulf as they are in the North Sea? By and large, they are the same. What, for ExxonMobil, we take what we believe to be the best practice, the best, and then apply that globally because it really doesn't matter where you are. If you, if you have a well control incident, you need to use the best you have everywhere in deep water drilling. And it's not an area where you make some distinction that I'm going to cut a corner in this country because I can. Well, I know that when the, the, in the North Sea when they had the accident, I think it was back in 1988, and uh, 100-some folks, 180 as I recall, uh, might have. Piper Alpha. Right. The uh, changes were made to, in essence, split the MMS similar to, or split the enforcement agency similar to what the administration is now proposing with the MMS. So is, that is a better system than what we have in the United States, right? You know, I don't know that the structure is as important as the competency and the process by which uh, the oversight occurs. Mr. Watson, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I can grade. Uh, all the differences across the jurisdiction. I just want to know what's, what, what is the what model should we lo be looking at and we start with the, the enforcement regulations, tool? Uh, Congressman, we start with the regulations in each country and then we apply uh, our standards on top of those regulations. And they are very similar. Uh, the application of our processes and procedures are very similar in, uh, in all the countries. Where there are particular requirements in a particular country, we of course uh, comply with those. Um, our view is certainly that the U.K. and the U.S. have very high standards. Mr. Mova? The greatest uh, part of our experience and operation has been in the North Sea, particularly Norway and the United Kingdom. And in Norway and the United Kingdom have especially developed some of the best practices that are applicable and used around the world. So it's based on our experience over many, several decades that uh, those best practices and oversight and review have been applied and used in the industry and other places of the world. So I would say that they, write, they rank right up at the top in terms of uh, capability 
and the development of practices. Mr. Odom. Similar answer in that I think the U.S. does have one of the most comprehensive set of recommendations for the industry in the world. There are, we, you can find other areas where a particular regulation may be more stringent than what you see in the U.S. The important part for us as a company is going back to what I called in my testimony our, our global standards, how we do things everywhere. Those often exceed the regulations in any country. Mr. McKay. Yes, I would agree with that. The standards are similar in many places with some specific differences, but the U.S. has a strong set of standards. I, I would add a comment that I think learning what we're learning through this will, will augment some of those standards and will be helpful. The gentleman from uh, Michigan's time has expired. The chair recognizes the chairman of the full committee, the gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman. Yesterday, uh, Chairman Stupak and I sent a letter to Tony Hayward, the CEO of BP, and the letter raised questions about the design and the safety decisions made by BP at its Macondo well. The letter describes a series of decisions that BP made that seemed to increase the risk of catastrophic blowout. I'd like to ask each of you whether you think mistakes were made by BP. Mr. Tilson. Well, in reviewing the letter that you both sent, it appears clear to me that a number of design standards were, that I would consider to be the industry norm, were not followed. Um, so let me go through this. If I could quickly, you think that they made mistakes. The answer would, you would give would be yes. We would not have drilled the well the way they did. Okay. And how about you, Mr. Watson? We've just had a chance to take a look at your letter. It's uh, quite lengthy, of course, with a number of detailed uh, comments. Our experts are taking a look at it. I've, I've read it myself, and uh, from what I've seen, it's uh, consistent with what the Joint Industry Task Force found, that there, we have an opportunity to raise the bar, if you will, on standards in the industry, and it certainly appears from your letter that, um, that, that not all standards uh, that we would recommend or that we would employ were in place. Does it, do any of you disagree with the statement that BP made mistakes? Okay. Uh, it's, no, it's not a disagreement. It's just, a, it's just confirmation that don't have all the information, but from the information that was in your letter and what we know about the well, a similar statement that it's not a well that we would have drilled with that mechanical okay. setup and there are operational concerns. Mr. Watson, uh, you're quoted in the Wall Street Journal as saying this incident was preventable. What mistakes did BP make that you would not have made? First, we'd, we would say that uh, as we look at this incident, uh, we need to let the investigation run its course. What we have done is since the first days of this investigation uh, and this accident, uh, we've participated in the Joint Industry Task Force where the industry... Uh, now, you, you made the statement. You were, you were quoted as saying this incident was preventable. Yes. What would you have done uh, differently to prevent the disaster that we've now encountered? There are several uh, areas that appear based on the information we've seen in the Joint Industry Task Force and based mm -hmm. on the information we've been able to gather that suggest that practices that we would not put in place were, em were employed here. Specifically? For, for example, uh, the casing design mm -hmm. and the mechanical barriers that were put in place uh, appear to be different than what we would use. Okay. Uh, Gary Laquette, uh, head Chevron's Exploration and Production Unit, and he said in the Wall Street Journal that Chevron uses a safer well design. Can you tell us why the Chevron well design is safer than BP's? It's those two characteristics that I commented there on top of what we think are effective procedures and, uh, and other authorities that we have in place that would have prevented this incident. Well, in the... Uh, in the well design, BP had a choice of two primary options. It could lower a full string of casing from the top of the well held to the bottom of the well, or it could hang a lifter, it could hang a liner from the lower end of the casing already in the well and insta install a tie back on top of the liner. Uh, a BP plan review recommended against the full string of casing because it would create an open annulus to the wellhead and make the seal assembly of the wellhead the only barrier to gas flow if the cement job failed. Um, would you have chosen the other option, and do you choose the other option in your wells? We would not have run a full string. You would not have, okay. 
Uh, Mr. Tillerson, you've made a similar claim today. You testified that, quote, what we do know is that when you properly design wells from the range of risks, risk anticipated, follow established procedures, build in layers of redundancy, uh, properly inspect and maintain equipment, train operators, conduct tests and drills, and focus on safe operations and risk management, tragic incidents like the one in the Gulf of Mexico today should not occur. Uh, Mr. Tillerson, you've said that this blowout would not have happened if ExxonMobil had been drilling the well. Tell us what you would have done differently, and please be specific. Well, it would have been a different well design. We would have run a liner, a tieback liner. We would have used a different cement formulation. We would have tested for cement integrity before we circulated the, the kill weight mud out. We would have had the locking seal ring at the, at the casing hanger before proceeding. Uh, and leading up to all of that, though, there was clearly, and this is just based on what's been publicly made available, uh, there were clearly a lot of indications of problems with this well going on for some period of time leading up to the final loss of control. And why, why those, why, how those were dealt with and why they weren't dealt with differently, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And we don't have all the information, and so I want to echo what Mr. Watson said there. We, do, we are very interested, as I said in my remarks, we want to see the full investigation because we want to understand was there something else people were looking at that caused them to make the decisions they made as opposed to making the decisions that almost any of our drilling operations people would have made differently that Thank led you. to the ultimate loss of the well. Thank you. My time is uh, uh, running out, but let me just make a statement, Mr. Chairman. I'd fe I feel more confident in these assurances if I didn't realize that each of the oil spill responses uh, plans uh, from the companies are virtually identical to BP's. Uh, you say you would have done things differently. I, I would think certainly in retrospect that's a statement you would certainly make. I hope that's true, but the record does not support that the other companies here today have been more prepared than BP and their plans were the same. So I, I thank you for your testimony. Um, we've got to learn from this experience and move on, but we really have to learn that uh, these things have to be thought out and the plan should not just be cookie cutter plans. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great. The uh, Chairman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the ranking member of the full committee, uh, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Barton. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, the stakes are a lot higher and, and the consequences are much more dire, but this reminds me a little bit of uh, a uh, Monday morning a uh, call-in radio talk show after the Redskins have blown another one. Uh, everybody has an idea of what should have been done, and now that they know what was done and it wasn't done properly, uh, they're much smarter than the coach on the field and the quarterback on the field uh, at the time. So it's very easy to second guess and to uh, point out the, uh, uh, the problems. Um, there's kind of good news, bad news. The bad news is that I agree with Chairman Waxman. Um, judgment calls were made that, that now that we're, uh, uh, now that we know what happened, that those were the improper judgment. That's bad, that's bad. But the good news is, and this is what our industry CEOs are saying, I think, is that it is preventable. You know, I, th I don't know what this task force is gonna recommend that Mr. Tillerson has alluded to, but, um, if, if the recommendation is that best practices on these deep wells ought to have these double sleeves, I think we could put that into a regu regulation if we need to. If the best practices is you ought to put the lockout collar on the well before you do the final cementing job, I think that's something that can be done. If the best practices is that, that we ought to really focus on degassing the mud before you recirculate it and do that final stage, when this accident occurred, I think, I think we'll go along with that. These are not huge, technically complex. We just don't know how to solve that particular problem. So that's, that's the good news. Now, my first question is to uh, the CEO of British Petroleum, or the president of British Petroleum USA. Has the federal government suggested, told, asked that you do anything that you've just flat said no to? In other words, if they propose some solutions that you've turned down and, you know, that in hindsight, if, if you'd have just done what you were told to do, that 
the well wouldn't continue to be leaking? No, I don't. I don't know of any um, solutions that have been proposed that we haven't haven't um, done. And it is it is BP's responsibility for the well. I mean, you are the owner of the well, but in terms of mitigation, in terms of the cleanup on the beaches, did BP tell the President of the United States that we shouldn't let the Louisiana people go out and, and do those uh, sand berms? Well, what we no, what, what what we've always said is what. What we're trying to do is work through unified command, and decisions for operational matters like that go through unified command. They did go through unified command, and we agreed once we were that was a unified command decision to go forward. Are any of you gentlemen here because you were subpoenaed? No. You're all here voluntarily. You've chosen as free citizens to come and, and answer any question that any member of this subcommittee has. Isn't that correct? In terms of in terms of BP this television camera that's showing the oil, isn't that your television camera? That's, that's the uh, remote operated vehicle cameras that are contracted. But you're yes. providing it right. voluntarily. Right. I think at Chairman Waxman's or Chairman Markey's suggestion or request, but you, you haven't been told by federal law you have to do that. No, we agreed with Department of Interior, MMS, Coast Guard, and others to supply right off the bat, but we have responded to requests to open that up to the public and, and other congressional members, yes. Now, I want to ask this question to ExxonMobil and to Chevron. If, if we were to maintain this so-called temporary moratorium in the, in the deep OCS, how does that affect your decision on how to get the energy that America needs to America? Do you just sit on your hands and hope that the moratorium goes away, or do you look for that energy somewhere else or perhaps even import it from somewhere else? Well, we will redirect our human resources, the technical talent, to other parts of the world where we are allowed to work, and we will redirect the rigs and the equipment elsewhere. We, this stuff is too expensive to let it just sit around. What's it cost per day? Well, the spread rate on a typical deep water well is about a million dollars a day. Mr. Chevron, do you echo what Mr. Exxon just said? Yes. We have uh, three deep water rigs right now, uh, two of which were operating at the time of the incident, additional one that came in, and the costs are similar to what Mr. Tillerson mentioned, and we will redeploy people and redeploy rigs if we're unable to put them into service. Now, I am told that the Chinese oil companies are drilling off the coast of Cuba which means they're drilling off the coast of um, Florida. Do any of you gentlemen have reason to believe that the Chinese oil companies are safer and more concerned about safety and environmental protection than U.S. oil companies? Anybody? I'm, I can't speak for those companies. I'm sure they're committed to safe operations. But I know... I know have they done anything that's more innovative than the United States oil companies have? Have they led the way in any area that you're aware of? I'm not aware of those. Okay. Um, last question. We've heard a lot in the scientific community about new ideas to, to, once you have an oil spill, to insert natural organisms that biodegrade it and turn it into non-harmful substances. Would any of you care to, to comment on you know, we want to prevent the spill. If we can't prevent it, we want to stop it. But if you have one, is there hope that someday we'll have organisms that, that, that biodegrade the oil very quickly so that it doesn't harm the, economy, the environment? Anybody? Well, I would, I would only comment, uh, Congressman Barton, that in effect, that's part of what the dispersant action does is to reduce the oil to very small droplets that then the natural microorganisms that exist in the marine environment are able to break that down more quickly. Uh, and there's been a lot of discussion around the dispersants and whatnot, but the dispersants have been uh, tested and are actually less toxic than detergent soap, which you would flush down your sink every day. Okay. Well, I want to thank Chairman Markey for his discretion in letting me go over. And let's work together to stop this spill figure out a way to prevent it in the future, and keep our industry and our environment uh, safe and growing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Michigan, the chairman emeritus of the committee, Mr. Dingell. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentlemen, yes or no each, if you please. You have seen, well, uh, this document, which is the Department of Interior's Increased Safety Measures for Energy Development in the Outer Continental Shelf. Uh, do any of you have any objections to the recommendations contained therein? Uh, Congressman Dingell, I've looked at the document and the task force that John Watson has referred to had significant input, input to the DOI's consideration. As I've looked at the specifics of in there, at what's in there, there are some areas where I'm concerned that they may be actually introducing more risk in their effort to improve the safe operation. Uh, they may actually be increasing the risk in some areas. So we, we want to have a thorough discussion with them and others around what risk are we trying to mitigate and is this actually going to accomplish that or in effect are we increasing risk in the operation. And again, that's, but I think it's a very good document. It's a very good start. Most of it we would strongly support. A lot of it we're already doing. Uh, so it's not going to be a difficult compliance issue for us. But there are some areas in there that I do have some concerns about. Uh, does that gentleman generally address your feelings? Each? Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Now, um, I note, and this would be uh, a, a concern here, I think, to Mr. McKay. Uh, the Deepwater Horizons blowout preventer contained a single set of blind shear rams. These blind shear rams were supposed to cut through the pipe in the case of emergency and stop the flow of oil and gas into the water. The blind shear rams obviously failed to carry out that function. Uh, do you support the idea that we should have double or redundant blind shear rams? We, we, have, we have recommended that the design of uh, blowout preventers should be evaluated based on what we learn here and potentially additional redundancy. Yes. Now, again, if you please, uh, Mr. McKay, how many vessels do you have down there in the area of the spill to collect the oil that is retrieved? Uh, do you have one? Do you have several? Uh, do you have more on the road? Are you going to run out of capacity to uh, receive the oil that you are retrieving? We have, we have two as of today receiving oil. Uh, we have several uh, that are being outfitted to, to arrive on location in the next couple of weeks, two more. And then we have an additional two on the way that should be outfitted and functional potentially by uh, mid-July. Uh, obviously, that's not counting skimmers and other vessels picking up oil that's on the surface. But in terms of taking production off the well, uh, we'll have up to roughly six that would take direct, direct production in the very near future. Now, I note that you are, however, burning or were burning some of the retrieved oil for want of, uh, for want of space or capacity to handle it. Is that still going on? The offshore burning occurs when there's enough oil in, in an area to boom and burn and when weather conditions permit, and that's under the Uni Unified Area Command. We will have uh, a vessel called the Helix 4000 on location and working hopefully today that will be burning oil that, it, that is uh, produced up to that vessel. Now, gentlemen, you are supposed, I believe, to have a plan to address spills or catastrophic events. I'm assuming that, that each of you do. Um, what is the date? Uh, well, first of all, is that plan for the whole of your operation, or is it for uh, item by item or specific site by specific site? Um, starting uh, with Mr. Tillerson. There is a, a Gulf regional plan, and then with each well, when we permit the well, there would be a plan to support that well's activities and operations. I think the, you know, the aspect of the plan, the cookie cutter characterization should not come as much of a surprise because the industry has relied upon sharing of resources, boats, booms, skimmer equipment. And in working with the Coast Guard and, and federal agencies, what we really should have is a unified plan because it doesn't matter whose well has the problem, 
when it has the problem, we need to be able to respond with everything we have available. So those plans look the same because, in fact, they call upon the same resources to respond. Now, gentlemen, would each of you submit the date on, of, of, of those plans so that we could know? You don't have to do it now. If, if, if we'll, I'll now ask that to be inserted in the record. Uh, now, the, uh, I am troubled here that um, everybody is blaming the administration for the events uh, that are going on down in, in the Gulf area. And I'm, I'm curious, what is the practice, if you please, starting Mr. Tillerson, with, does, does the federal government take responsibility of the operator? Well, the Coast Guard has command of the incident after, it, after you have the, the spill. The responsible party then works in the unified command structure with the Coast Guard on the spill response. So the Coast Guard does ultimately make final decisions on your actions. Your actions have to be approved by the Coast Guard, uh, but it is very much done, obviously, in a joint fashion. And the Coast Guard makes determination of when certain cleanup activities should be undertaken, how they should be undertaken, and when you should stop. Now, Mr. McKay, uh, do you agree with that statement? I do. Uh, the, the incident commander is the Coast Guard, uh, and final decisions are by the Coast Guard under that incident command structure. Uh, but I also agree with the statement that m much of this is uh, collaborative in terms of decision making, but the final decisions for deployment of resources is with the, with now, the command if, structure. If you please, Mr. McKay, uh, in the case of the event we're discussing here, uh, has the Coast Guard made any recommendations with which uh, BP did not agree? I think, no, I don't think there have been any recommendations that BP did not agree. The decisions have been effectively worked together through the unified structure and the major decisions have occurred under that structure and with, with our support. Was there any, has there been any conflict between the administration and BP with regard to uh, the cleanup that has been going forward? Uh, on spill response, within the unified command structure, there have been, you know, d debates about deployment and when and where and how, and that's part of the command structure. But I think all the major decisions have been, uh, that have been made have been supported by BP. Now, uh, is it your view that the government should take over the cleanup, or is it uh, your view that that should remain as it is now, or should it be the principal and sole responsibility of the uh, operator or the uh, holder of the lease? I think overall the command structure and the way the national contingency plan as well as the, the, the Gulf of Mexico plans work is effective. I think this actually, I, I understand everyone's frustration with how long this is taking, but the spill response has actually been pretty effective in terms of dealing with it on the water. It's unfortunate we can't get it stopped at the source right now. We're doing everything we can to do that. But I think, I think the command structure has actually been uh, functional, and, and the spill response plans have been leaned upon and been the foundation of that. Now, um, in one recommendation that the Secretary has made, uh, he recommends that there be the finalization of a rule that would require the operators of drilling wells to develop robust safety and environmental management systems for offshore drilling operations. In 2009, when this was first, first proposed, the Offshore Operators Committee and the American Petroleum Institute raised concerns about it. I believe, gentlemen, uh, you are all members of both bodies. Would you support at this? Is there anyone at the table who would not support the finalization of that rule? I notice, Mr. Tillerson, you've got the same problem I do, and I, if I'm not coming through very well, I'm afraid. Uh, just, just want to be clear what you're referring to, Congressman. 
Do you, uh, would you support the finalization of that rule, sir? I'm not sure I'm clear on exactly what rule you're referring to, Congressman Dingle. I well, the, the secretary in his, one of his recommendations is that the finalization of the rules requiring drilling, rather operators of drilling wells to develop robust safety and environmental management systems for offshore drilling operations. And my question to you, gentlemen of the panel, is would you support such a uh, recommendation? Uh, that's known as the SEMS rule. I'd have to go back and look at the specifics, Congressman. Quite frankly, I, I don't remember enough of the details. All right. I'm sure we had would reasons reach, of, that we were concerned reach, with it. Would you each, gentlemen, if you please, submit your comments on that yes, point to the committee and whether you would support that or not? And Mr. Yes. Chairman, I thank you for your courtesy. And gentlemen, thank you for your kindness. We thank the um, gentleman. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Burgess. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me just go back to a question I posed, a rhetorical question I posed in my opening statement. Uh, everyone in the panel before us, with the exception of Mr. McKay, let me just ask you a question. Is there, is there any idea uh, that you have at this point that would stop that leak from occurring in the Gulf of Mexico? Is there something you could share with us this morning that has not been done or tried that will, that will bring a conclusion, a rapid conclusion to this? We know BP doesn't have that idea. Do any of the rest of you? We've, we've provided our experts to assist Congressman, and I'm not aware of any uh, ideas uh, that, that uh, beyond those that have been employed or that we've... Uh, no, no ideas have been suggested that have been taken up. Now, again, with everyone, with the exception of Mr. McKay, we know that BP has not been to the White House to talk to the President. Have, have any of the rest of you uh, had conversations with the White House about the management of this situation in the Gulf? Mr. Tillerson? Is that, that's an affirmative answer? I've had very uh, brief conversations. With the President himself or with his advisors? Both. Any of the rest of the I've gentlemen? Had, I've had a very brief conversation, but not with the President. Okay. Let me ask you a question. A week ago, we went down to the Gulf and had the testimony on a field hearing on oversight and investigations. We heard from two of the ladies who lost husbands on, this, on the rig. Uh, Mr. McKay, you were present at our first hearing on oversight and investigations. I didn't get a bit of information that day from, from yourself, Transocean, Halliburton, and the blow-up protector manufacturer was here. I learned a lot more from those two ladies uh, talking about emails they'd had with their husbands, phone calls they'd had with their husbands, uh, discussions they'd had with their husbands back home when they came home for visits. Um, and it seemed to be there was a lot of concern about things that were happening on the rig. Now, I've never worked on a deep water rig. Have any, have any of you worked on a, a rig? Not a deep water rig, but I worked on rigs earlier in my career. Well, let me just ask you a question. Is that unusual? I mean, you know, I go home and complain about Mr. Markey a lot. <laughs> but is this unusual to have that level of anxiety that, uh, that these gentlemen were, were sharing with their wives about the safety? conditions on a, on a, on an offshore rig? Well, Congressman, I haven't, I'll be, I mean, I haven't looked at their testimony in detail, so I can't comment directly to that. What, um, as I commented, clearly there were some things going on with this well uh, in the days and hours prior to the loss of control that we're interested to understand, and it's, and it's incomplete at this point. Let me and ask so you a I, question. I, I can't really say. Now, what I would say that well control is part of drilling. That's what drilling operations are about. You are trying to drill into the forces of Mother Nature and hold that back in a controlled fashion until you can then secure it. And so it is common to be dealing with well control issues on a well in a, in a routine manner. And the reason you have the well design and the layers of redundancy and all the safety equipment is, and the training is so you can deal with those. It is not uncommon to take a gas kick in a well and have to circulate that kick out in a controlled fashion and restabilize the well so you can continue your operation. To do that, you have to have good well bore integrity and good equipment and people that know what they're doing. And that's why in my testimony I said, when you have those things, you can deal with well control issues and maintain the integrity of the well and not lose uh, the control of the well and have what's happened out there. Have any of you ever ceased operations on a well because it was difficult to control or you yes. didn't feel like you had control. Yes. 
The answer is yes. So that does happen. Certainly our people yes. have, yes. And who would generally make that call? Would it be the, uh, in, in the case here, would it be Transocean or would it be BP? Uh, would it be the owner of the, of, of the platform or the, or, the, or the driller? Well, we would, we as the owner of the well or the operation would make that decision and depending on what the severity of the issue was and what was at stake, it would be made by a line manager somewhere in the drilling organization, but there have been at least one instance that came all the way to my level. Let's see. Uh, Mr. Mulvall, let me ask you a question, because in your testimony you talked about natural gas and, and the use of natural gas as, as one of those bridge fuels to the, to the future. And yet, we can, we, of course, we can extract a lot of natural gas on land where it's not an issue with drilling a mile down in the Gulf. But we also have issues of where that drilling is occurring because now it's occurring closer and closer to civilization and sometimes right on top of civilization. Mr. Tillerson mentioned the loss of the public trust with the, the energy industry. What are you doing to create the best practices so that people on land who are nearby to the gas drilling operations can have the comfort that their safety is protected, that they're not being exposed to benzene and hexane, that the fracking fluid is not going to contaminate their water wells. How are, how are you taking a leadership role in the industry to be certain that those things are, are being handled appropriately? Well, we have a great deal of experience as a company and as an industry, and we share those practices. But it all goes back to fundamentally how you plan and design and execute and complete and drill those wells. Uh, also, it's most important how you develop the infrastructure so as you develop the gas and you bring it to the marketplace that that's done through the infrastructure and the pipelines in a way that's uh, very secure and safe. And uh, we really feel that by doing this in a proper way, meaning the plan and design, that, uh, and we have many, many decades of experience that this can be done. And uh, there's nothing really that unique from a technological point of view of our ability as, as an industry to develop the gas resources, whether you call them unconventional or conventional resources, that can be developed in North America. It's a, it's a tremendous resource. Our, our, our country is blessed with natural gas. It's not just a transition fuel. It's an integral part of the energy supply that we're going to need for our society and for our economy. Well, I, I may have some additional questions for you on, on, on that issue, and I would appreciate you working with our office so that we can be confident of those best practices, because I'll just tell you, in my neighborhoods, you may not, it may, may not be as secure as you think. Now I'll yield back, Mr. Chair. We thank the gentleman. The Chair recognizes the uh, Chairman of the um, Oversight and Investigations uh, Subcommittee, the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Stupak. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Waxman and I sent that letter yesterday, and uh, Mr. Tillerson, uh, you'd respond a little bit to it. And, and we talked about the five areas where we feel BP should have done things differently to get control of this uh, well. In fact, they used the word nightmare well in, in one of the uh, emails that we looked at and put in our report. And, and I was struck, Mr. Tillerson, um, you indicated in, in your testimony, uh, based on the industry's extensive experience, you state that what we do know is that when you properly design wells for the range of risk anticipated, follow the established procedures, build in layers of redundancy, properly inspect and maintain equipment, train operators, conduct tests and drills, and focus on safe operations and risk management, tragic incidents like the one we're witnessing in the Gulf today should not occur. And I mention that because in today's post, the exact same words are there exactly the same as your testimony, but it's attributed to Kenneth P. Cohn, Exxon Mobil's VP of Public and Government Affairs. And in my opening statement, I mentioned how in your 500-page response plan, 40 is on press, and that you all stay on script. I got to compliment you. You're all on script. You're using the same words. But that was the problems with the well, as Mr. Waxman pointed out in his testimony. So what about are you all on script that if it wasn't BP, but one of you, one of your companies, if that was you and the blowout happened on April 20th, if you had received the call that there was a subsea blowout at your well instead of BP's, would you have been prepared to stop the leak and prevent oil from reaching the sensitive coastal areas? 
So would your company have been ready, Mr. Tillerson? We would have been ready to implement our oil spill response plan. That's that nine-page plan, right? It's That's that 500-page plan you referred to. Okay. There's and only then, nine on oil site, removal. 40 on media, specific. nine on oil removal. So that nine pages would have been able to prevent the oil from hitting the Gulf Shores? The nine-page plan would have done what the nine-page page plan says it's intended to do, and it says to okay. the maximum extent practicable. Okay. How about you, Mr. Watson? I would tell you, Cong Congressman, that our emphasis is on uh, prevention of that spill. You were talking about Sure, but let's say this. You got the call on April 20th. Your, your well just blew. What would you have done? Before the incident? Yes. We would have exercised stop work authority. Okay. Well, we, we have okay. rigorous stop work authority, not only written down, but we use stop work authority. Okay, but your well blew up, so what would you do? We, we would activate our spill response plan. Okay. To That's about five pages, I think, in your proposal, right? Yes. To remove the oil? See, my concern is, Mr. Tillerson, Mr. Movison, um, Chevron and Shell's worst case scenario is 200,000 barrels per day in their response plan. Exxon Mobil's is 166 barrels per day. That's a lot more than what's currently leaking out into the Gulf. So on paper, these plans, and you're going to rely on these plans, might seem real reassuring, but reality shows you can't prevent the oil from reaching the Gulf shores. So Mr. Tillerson, Exxon Mobil states in its response to the pre-hearing questions that Exxon Mobil is prepared to meet all the commitments in its permits, including those involving a worst case, case scenario. So do you stand by that statement? I do because the permit does not guarantee that the oil will not get to the shore, nor does it guarantee that it will all be okay. contained. Well, we're at what? At most 40,000 barrels today? I don't know. 40,000, I think, is what we've been saying, I think, for the record. So ExxonMobil's worst case scenario is over 160,000 barrels per day. So how can you say that? you'd be able to control a spill that's four times bigger than the current spill using the same plan BP has with the same contractors BP is using. As I said, Congressman, we would use the, the response capability to the maximum extent practicable. Okay. And in the models that, okay. that we provide as part of the permitting, which are in conformance with what the regulatory bodies require. Your plan, your plan and I would is written there by would the be same impact. contractor that BP is. BP relied on Marine Spill Response Corporation to provide response equipment, and so does your plan. So if you can't handle 40,000, how are you going to handle 166,000 per day, as you indicate? The answer to that is when these things happen, we are not well equipped to deal with them. So when these things happen, these worst case scenarios, we can't handle them, correct? We are not well equipped to handle them. There will be impacts, as we are seeing. And we've never represented anything different than that. And you've all said that's that. that's why the emphasis is always on preventing these things from occurring. Because sure. when they happen, we're not very well equipped to deal with them. And that's just a but, fact of the enormity of what we're dealing with. But they do happen. And in an answer to Mr. They just happened. Mr. Waxman, you said, yep, it's cookie cutter plans. And we call upon the same resources. The resources for BP are not enough. So no matter which one of the oil companies here before us had the blowout, the resources are not enough to prevent what we're seeing day after day on the Gulf. Not only the loss of 11 people, but we're on day, what, 56 or 57 of oil washing up on shores. There is no other plan, there's no way to stop what's happening until we finally cap this well. Correct? That is correct. So, but for the grace of God, there goes I, right? It's BP this time. It could be ExxonMobil tomorrow. It could be Chevron tomorrow. It could be not if, we, not if we follow our practices and procedures, it won't be. But if it does, we can't handle it. We can't handle the spill. This well, worst case scenario is pie in the sky and oil in our water and on our shores. It's a scenario that the MMS and the Coast Guard require us to calculate using their methodologies, and that's why it's in there. But, but to your point, and I think that's all that matters is, the point is, we, we have to take every step to prevent these things from happening because when they happen, it is a fact that we're not well equipped to prevent any and all damage. Sure. There will be damage occur. Sure. We satisfy the application, but in reality, we can't respond to a worst case scenario. We are responding. A response is underway. It is having some effect as if there were no response, 
but there is no response capability that will guarantee you will never have an impact. It does not exist and it probably will never exist. Nor do you have ability to respond to the worst case scenario. If we can't handle 40,000, how can we handle 166? The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Shimkus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm handling uh, the attack a little bit different. I have 3,000 Facebook followers. I posed a question. I'm going to get a chance to visit with you all today. Uh, I got 22 questions in response. We chose five of them. And I'm going to kind of weave them into some of the things that we've already heard in question and answer in the testimony. The first one is from Randy from Greenville. He says, what will be the impact on the U.S. economy by stopping offshore drilling? And if I were to answer him saying that the moratorium is idling 33 rigs, which affects 46,500 direct jobs, 330 million in, in lost wages, and if it goes uh, for a six-month moratorium, that would be about $10 billion to the Federal Treasury. Would that be, would that be numbers that would sound correct? I know some of you have actual drilling rigs, but I'm, I'm seeing some nodding. So uh, the second question is, we haven't heard anything directly from the workers on the rig that saw what happened. That's why I was talking to my, my good friend, uh, Mr. Scalise. Uh, Brian from St. Louis says, I want them answering questions in front of congressional panels. I've heard nothing but the story that some methane gas came up through the line. Now, I know at the field hearing of last week, they did have the widows, and uh, Mr. Scalise mentioned the compelling testimony. I think during that testimony also, the widows said, we need to be drilling. And I think what we're learning is there's lost livelihood on the coast because of the environmental disaster. We need to be careful not to compound that loss of jobs and an economy by shutting down operations uh, right now. So that's my response to Brian. Another Brian from Meadowsville says, what types of regulations would have prevented another tragic incident like this from occurring? Also, what do you suggest we do in regarding to forming an emergency response teams for disaster of this magnitude? My friend Michael Doyle mentioned how long it took to get a response team to Pennsylvania. I would ask that in this emergency uh, uh, best practices thing that we're reviewing, that we start, the industry start talking about a consortium of an emergency response team that we can mobilize. Obviously, this is bigger than anything we would have projected. I think Mr. Stupak is also highlighting that, even in the emergency response plans where you're projecting billions of, of barrels. Uh, this is something that we, we have been overwhelmed. So part of that planning, I would suggest that we do in forming an emergency response team Hopefully we'll, this will never happen again, but it'd be nice to have if we're in that venue. Uh, Doug Oyster from Collins, from my hometown of Collinsville, says, uh, uh, talks about we have a ConocoPhillips refinery locally in, in my area. I'm very proud of it. Uh, the, he, he mentioned uh, a refinery fire, but it was contained. He says, what, do we, what risk do we face on land-based facilities as well? As well? And I think what the story that's not told, and, and Joe Barton's mentioned this a couple times, is you're in the deep water because that's where major oil finds are. And I have marginal oil production in southern Illinois, and it's about a barrel a day. Okay? We still produce. We're the 10th leading state. But it's not very much, and we're proud of what we get out of the ground. But um, um, Mr. Mova, since I've been to the... the, the the refinery there uh, numerous times. Uh, I, one thing that is important, if we're, we're talking about all the above energy strategy, and I'll, I'll talk <laughs> climate, I'll fight this climate debate another, another day, but we can agree on North American energy um, independence. And what your refinery is doing in the St. Louis metropolitan area is bringing tar sands oil down through a pipeline that can be refined in the, in the Midwest so that we will be less dependent on imported crude oil and we may not have to be in places that are tough. So, you know, that's a, that's a shout out. I've also talked to this committee numerous times about coal liquid technologies using the Fisher Tropes techniques. That would be another way to displace our reliance on imported crude oil and, and, and stuff. So, um, that expansion for this heavy 
uh, Canadian sand crude oil, right now there are 2,500, at the peak there was 4,000 construction jobs on an average of $67,000 salary per year. Uh, I think 10 different unions building. Uh, that's the importance of the fossil fuel sector in this country. They're good paying, uh, big number jobs. I've always used your refinery there and the Prairie State coal fire power plant we're building in this economy to have still on site in addition to 2,500 jobs, that's energy security. Um, that's not including the 750 full-time jobs that are there. And the, uh, uh, so energy security is, is part of this debate and we're in the deep water. The vast majority of the time we're doing it successfully. We need low-cost energy to make us competitive in, in the world today. I hear from um, Michelle from Staunton says, how much money are they spending on technology to put safety measures in place? So let me ask this question so I can get at least one response from you instead of my filibuster. A second blowout preventer in deep water applications, what would that cost? Go ahead, Mr. Tillerson on down. I'd have to ask my experts. It, it would not represent a huge additional cost for the daily spread rate. And I think the, the real question or that we want to look at is, when you do that, do you change in some way the safe operation of the mechanisms you have, which have worked very well for 14,000 wells? So we just, want to, we just want to be careful that we understand I mean, it's not really a cost issue. Yeah, well, yeah, and I think I've been told $15 million. But we've been told that there, this is a requirement in other places around the world in, in some operations. So that might be something that the, your, the panel might, might want to consider. Can, any, can anyone address this debate about lifting the cap? Helpful, harmful for uh, current operations and future operations? Don't be shy. Well, given the situation, we are facing an unprecedented event that we never expected would take place. So obviously, given the situation, I think it's appropriate for us to take a look at the cap, what it should be, uh, most likely needs to be raised. And in doing so, though, I think the industry should come forth, the, uh, the states and the federal government should come forth and make a good judgment and form decision on what that cap should be. But we've obviously faced an unprecedented situation, and uh, it needs to be evaluated and changed. Yeah, I, I would just. I would just comment that it's a, a combination of financial capacity, uh, general funds that would be made available from industry contributions, insurance, um, in in total that can that can uh, realize an effective system for ensuring that there are funds available for responding to an incident like this. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Doyle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, would, would you gentlemen all agree that Americans' confidence in the ability of the oil industry to, to go deep water safely has been shaken by this event? Would you all agree with that statement? And that it's in all of your best interest to restore the confidence so that, because we want this resource, but, but this price is, is way too high of a price to pay for it, what we're seeing right now. Uh, let me ask you a question. I get asked this a lot. and, and uh, Mr. Tillerson, I think you basically made the statement that, hey, we need to stop this before it happens, because once it happens, we, we, we really don't have a good way to, to stop what's going on here, right? Uh, a lot of people have suggested this idea of why isn't it required that we drill a relief well the same time we're drilling the main well, so that if, if this situation that is occurring right now, uh, if that relief well was already drilled and sitting there, that we'd have been able to cap this well, well uh, certainly a lot quicker than we're, we're doing right now. Uh, I'd like to hear from each one of you whether or not you think it's a good idea to require uh, that a relief well be, be drilled simultaneously with the main well uh, as a condition for future drilling. Well, I would say you just doubled your risk. Um, this is an exploration well, so it means you're drilling in an area that's not previously been drilled before. If you look at the history of, of well control problems and blowouts, most of them have occurred on the way down to the objective, not once they reach the objective. They, they're, they're caused by shallow, shallow gas hazards, they're caused by unknown pore pressures on the way down to the objective. 
So you, if you have two wells going down at the same time, it just means you have now increased your risk of having a problem on both of them. I, I don't think it is a viable nor necessarily a good risk management option to consider. Next. We favor redundancies in the well design and in how we, and in how we drill uh, our, our wells. We don't think that a relief well will reduce the risk and we don't advocate it. Given that we feel that with time we will show that this incident and accident, tragic accident, uh, certainly could have been preventable. What we have found is that the response to such an unprecedented situation is inadequate. So the question is really what could, what could we or should we be doing to improve our response because the only certainty that we see today is a relief well. I think that we need to spend a fair degree of time and money and resources on technology so as to improve our capability on the seabed to contain and capture uh, out of control well. Second, I think technology-wise, we are going to have to do a much better job of, of uh, when oil gets on the water to contain it in a smaller area and have more capability to, to handle it. And maybe thir and third is I think we also need to learn from this incident and situation a far more effective, efficient approach with respect to oversight and, and regulation. Thank you. Yes. I generally agree with the comments that have been made. I think the, just to go back to one point, though, the real opportunity is the redundancy, meaning the multiple barriers, the way a well is drilled, it is a well's design. Those need to be testable, verified, in place barriers. That is the opportunity. Uh -huh. Mr. McKay? Yes, I generally agree, and I think we will learn quite a bit about subsea intervention capability that can be developed going forward. Yeah, I, I, and Mr. Maher, I appreciate your, your response. I, it just seems to me that since the only solution left to us at this point seems to be to get that relief well down there, uh, that a lot of people are asking the question, why isn't one there in the first place? Uh, and it just seems to me that it, it, I read it would cost $100 million to drill a relief well when you are, I'm sure BP wishes they, they spent that $100,000 before they drilled this one. Uh, it just seems to me that right now I don't understand a better answer of how we stop this when it happens than to get a relief well down there. And the thought that it takes two months or three months to do that while all that oil comes out of the ground just, just uh, seems in, in, in incredible to me. Uh, let me ask uh, in, in the time I have remaining uh, that uh, the, in 2000 the Mineral Management Service proposed the rule to implement best cementing practices for offshore drilling operations. Uh, we know now that cementing was a factor uh, in, in what went wrong here and that uh, MMS was concerned that operators were using unregulated cementing procedures. Um, in light of, of the recent events that we see here, uh, I would like to ask each one of our, our witnesses if they think cementing should finally be regulated, if there should be a standard for it. Well, I think as is footnoted in Chairman Waxman and, and uh, Congressman Stupak's letter, uh, the API already has a number of standards and recommended practices for cement and cementing operations. And I think had those been followed, that, at least that element in this case might have been eliminated. But it is a voluntary standard, is it not? I mean, there is no penalty for not following it. Well, I guess that is right, other than if you want to live with that risk. I see. It is a risk. I guess it is a risk management decision. Yeah, I, I guess it sort of gets down, I, I see my time has expired, Mr. Chairman, uh, as to whether or not we just have voluntary best practices that, that we count on you guys to, to implement or whether we make sure they, they are implemented. And, and Mr. Chairman, I Well, and whether you can keep your regulations up with the technology. Yeah. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Shattuck. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank you, gentlemen, for being here. Um, I think every single American wants first and most, foremost to see the flow stop and to see the area cleaned up. Unfortunately, I am afraid that many simply want to exploit this uh, as a crisis, recognizing that you should never let a good crisis uh, go to waste, as Mr. Rahm Emanuel said, rather than to deal with it uh, and learn from it. I want to begin by asking each of you to respond to this question. Uh, specifically, the question is, is there more that you could do or your company could do, or are there assets that you have whether it is booms or ships or whatever, that you could uh, deploy to assist in either stopping the current flow or cleaning up the current flow? Just yes or no, or, or, or a brief explanation. 
Mr. Tillerson, I'd like to ask just the four, Tillerson, Watson, Mulvan, Odom. No, we've made everything available uh, that we have. I'm not, aware. I'm not aware of any resource we haven't made available. Mr. Mulva? made available. All made available. It doesn't mean everything we've offered has been used, but it's all been made available, yes. My next question is, uh, were you asked to make that available by the President, or were you asked to make that available by BP, or on what basis did you make that av available? Well, we made, uh, we made certain equipment and facilities available immediately after the incident occurred as just part of our industry mutualized response. Uh, we then were contacted subsequent to that, at least I was, by Admiral Allen requesting specific needs they had and just wanted to know if there were, you know, if we had any other way that we could help them with those Mr. specific Watson, needs. Uh, similar response in that we made uh, equipment available and then I did receive a call from Tony Hayward on some specific individuals. Let me just cut off short. Was anybody contacted by the President? No. Or by anybody in the White House? Um, there has been a lot of focus today on what you do after the spill occurs, and yet uh, it seems to me everything I can read about this indicates that what went wrong went wrong before the spill occurred. Um, indeed, there was a lengthy uh, op-ed placed in the Wall Street Journal by Mr. Hayward, uh, I believe on May 25th, and last Friday on June 11th, uh, the President of Samson Oil and Gas Company, Mr. Terry Barr, wrote a letter to the editor, which the Wall Street Journal published, and uh, in it he said this oil disaster was about human, not system, failures. And he cites a series of red flags uh, having to do with uh, the incorrect cementing job uh, uh, um, and, and other things, all based on the testimony by BP before this committee on uh, uh, earlier this year. Uh, where the BP came, BP came in and was asked about what it did and what tests it performed, uh, the, I guess, inadequate shoe, uh, uh, the failure to get a top plug. Um, I, was, I would like to know if uh, each of you have kind of indicated that th this is not the real well you would have drilled or you would not have drilled it in this fashion. Uh, have any of you happened to read this letter to the editor? I've seen it. Anybody else seen it? Mr. Odom, you saw it. Uh, Mr. Mulva, you have seen it. Mr. Tillerson, you have not seen it. Of the three of you that did see it and read it, do you agree with it and with specifically with the fact that it cites a number of red flags uh, that should have been indicators that uh, safety procedures or uh, different procedures should have been followed going forward? I haven't said that I have evaluated, or evaluated it and the merits of it, but the basic content is consistent with some of the concerns that have been cited elsewhere. Mr. Mulva? In drilling these types of wells, uh, we look at how the, the well was drilled. And based on publicly available information, uh, we wouldn't have drilled the well that way. Uh, we feel that it's most important to have two barriers to contain or control the hydrocarbons verified and tested by pressure to verify those two barriers exist. And in those two barriers, the blowout preventer is not one of the two barriers. Fair enough. Uh, Mr. Odom. The, the referring to the letter, the piece that is consistent is, from my point of view, is yes, systems are extremely important. They have to be right, well designed and so forth. The other critical element is the human side of that. So, you know, our philosophy is we focus on that culture, a safety culture, a culture that stops work if something doesn't look or feel right, that anybody on the site, doesn't matter if it's in a shell employee or not, can stop that work. That culture is critical. Mr. Chairman, I would like permission to put this in the record. Unanimous consent. Without objection, the letter that the gentleman from Arizona is referring to will be included in the record. I believe you are all aware that the President has instituted a six-month moratorium on deep water drilling. It is apparently that even on shallow water drilling there is, a, there is at least a stoppage uh, based on new procedures that are supposed to come out very quickly. That moratorium was based on a report uh, requested by the Interior Secretary called the in Increased safety measures for energy development on the outer continental shelf. Have, and, and I assume you have all seen that report. It was held up by Mr. Dingell earlier. Is that correct? Um, you are all aware that seven of the scientists who worked on that report have now written a letter indicating that it was modified after they uh, either wrote it or uh, reviewed its content and that they do not, uh, let me quote, uh, those seven scientists have said, uh, we do not report. We believe the report, or unmodified report, does not justify the moratorium as written 
and the moratorium as changed will not, or as, as actually impl implemented, will not contribute measurably to increased safety, will have immediate and long-term economic arguments, and they say an argument can be made that changes made in the wording of the report are counterproductive to long-term safety. Have you rever reviewed their letter of concern to the Secretary of Interior? Any of you? I have not. Um, well, let's talk about some of the things it says. Uh, it says, point blank, we do not agree that a six-month blanket moratorium, we do not, do not agree with the six-month blanket moratorium on deep water drilling. It says, a blanket moratorium is not the answer. It will not measurably reduce risk. It will have a lasting impact on the nation's economy, which may be greater than that of the oil spill. Um, they seem to be pretty upset I'm that sorry. their report. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, could you just refer? I've, I've, I've seen those recommendations. Yeah. They seem to be pretty upset that their report was altered, apparently by the Secretary of Interior, after they signed off on it and then sent to the President. I'd like to know uh, how many jobs will be lost if the moratorium is overly broad and what the consumer impact will be if the moratorium is overly broad, and do you think the moratorium is needed, or do you think it, as apparently these scientists think, it is overly broad? Mr. Tillerson? Well, I understand, you know, the motivation uh, for the moratorium and the desire to have, a, in effect, a stand down to ensure that the ongoing operations are being carried out safely. Now, the uh, Department of Interior Secretary Salazar did immediately order a reinspection of every deep water drilling rig and activity out there. Those inspections were carried out. In fact, some of them were carried out twice, and there were no deficiencies of concern that were identified. So, in my view, I think the moratorium uh, was unnecessary in terms of uh, the extent and the length of it. Uh, and so, I would, you know, I would hope that that could be revisited very quickly. Mr. Watson, the gentleman's uh, time. Has yeah, if, if the other three gentlemen could just quickly say whether they agree or disagree. I, I would agree. I would tell you that we have. Do, that, thank, thank you, sir. Um, Mr. Mulva. Uh, with respect to the moratorium, we, we can we, drill. We, he, the gentleman just needs a yes or no. Yeah. If you can, um, I, I apologize to the gentleman. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee. Thank you. I think what is so disturbing, at least to me, uh, in this investigation is that this was not simple human, one human failure of running through a stop sign. It was going through one stop sign after another. No batteries in the blowout preventer, hydraulic leak not fixed, failure to do a cement log, uh, not having adequate centralizers when their own personnel recognized they didn't have enough of it. We get an email from someone said, but who cares, it's done, end of story, we'll probably be fine and get a, a, a good cement job. I mean, if. If the airline industries was operated the way this particular situation was, no one would fly an airplane. And the whole industry now, I think, needs to think seriously about what we do about this. One of the things is the corporate culture. And I, I think there's a serious question about the corporate culture here with British Petroleum, um, whether or not it really rewards and insists on safety performance. Uh, Mr. McKay, uh, how many people have lost their jobs as a result of, of this uh, of this disaster at British Petroleum? I don't, I don't know of any yet that have lost their jobs. There are, uh, I think, a couple people that have been placed on administrative leave as the investigations are conducted, but I don't know of any yet. Do you think that that will happen over time? I, I, it's hard to speculate, but uh, I assure you that if, um, if, if, if the investigations show that, that, that people made mistakes they shouldn't have made, that could very well occur. Yeah. Well, we'll be watching, and certainly in the U.S. Navy, they would have a culture that would respond to this adequately. And, and I can just tell you, my constituents are not impressed with the response yet from British Petroleum in this regard. Second, we want to ask about whether or not the industry has made appropriate investments in improving safety of offshore drilling. We're going deeper and deeper in the water, extraordinarily deep, as our oil supplies dwindle. And the risks increase. I think everybody acknowledges that. So the question is, what is the industry investing to try to determine that? British Petroleum, we asked these questions to the five companies here. British Petroleum responded that they had spent $10 million in one year in, in research for offshore safety technology investments. How much did British Petroleum pay its CEO last year in relationship to that $10 million you spent on trying to come up with safety offshore drilling techniques? I don't, I don't know his exact pay. 
Well, the published report suggests that he was paid about $36.5 million, three times more. You paid your CEO three times more than you spent in your entire research budget to determine how to reduce the catastrophic, the risk of catastrophic failure in the offshore oil fields. Do you think that is an appropriate prioritization for a company in your business? I can't comment on his salary. I actually don't think that's a correct number. So can we get back to you on his salary? But uh, thank you. And just so you know, you're not alone on this. Uh, Conoco spent 0.008 percent of its of its profits on trying to improve offshore technology. Exxon spent 0.08 percent. British Petroleum spent 0.06 percent. Those are not huge numbers. And I think it's pretty apparent, given this risk and given the increasing risk of going deeper in water, we encourage the industry to start making more serious investments to try to prevent these, these situations from taking place. The third thing I want to ask the industry about is about the investments you all are making in an attempt to prevent invisible oil spills. And I'll just ask you very quickly, does everyone agree that every single oil well you drill and that we use ends up in an invisible oil spill because we burn it, it makes carbon dioxide, the carbon dioxide goes into the oceans, the oceans are now being more acidic because of the carbon dioxide and they are 30 percent more acidic in pre-industrial times because of the carbon dioxide that comes from burning fossil fuels. Obviously you are not responsible for all of that. But very quickly, can you all just say yes or no if you agree with that? Just start with Mr. McKay, very quickly. I, I would not agree with that characterization. Okay. It's not a yes or no question, I don't think. I do see the link between oil production and CO2. I don't agree. There are emissions associated with our operations and our product. It's a scientific debate, so I'm not sure we can answer yes or no. Well, actually, it's not a scientific debate. We've had a lot of hearings on this, and there is no scientific debate about this. Uh, carbon dioxide makes the oceans more acidic. And your joint investment as percentages of your gross revenues for energy sources that won't put carbon dioxide in the air are ConocoPhillips, 0.03 percent of revenues, Exxon, 0.1 percent, Chevron, 0.31 percent, Shell, 0.26 percent, British Petroleum, which at one time was meant to be called Beyond Petroleum, 0.09 percent. And I, I've got to ask you, to me, those investments, and we appreciate any investment you make, but isn't it clear that at that level of investment, we will not be able to solve this problem of pollution in the oceans caused by carbon dioxide? Would everybody agree with that? We'll start with Mr. McKay. The, the changeover and the transition to alternative energy will take quite a while and a tremendous amount of investment. Well, let me just ask you, let me ask you this question. Does everybody agree we've got to up our investment in clean energy technologies if we're going to solve this problem of carbon dioxide acidifying the oceans? We'll start, Mr. Start with the, on the other side of the table. Please make it yes and no. These are not, these issues are too important and too complex to be reduced to yes or no answers. And so I, you know, I'm just not going to go there with you. This is too important to have a yes or no conversation. Well, I appreciate your written response. We'll, if, we'll look forward to that if you can provide us with that. Is that okay? Thank you very much. I appreciate that. The gentleman's that. time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Blunt. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, Mr. McKay, on uh, the, the issue of cleanup, uh, I think your company has said that you're going to be fully responsible for whatever the cost of the cleanup. <coughs> Is that right? That is correct. And uh, what about uh, economic damages? Yes, we've said that we would honor all legitimate claims. That's right. So the current cap, which actually I've, I've introduced some legislation that would retroactively impact that cap, but you're, you're not concerned by the, you're not going to use the limit of the current civil damages cap at all. You've, you've pledged to take, to uh, respond to all legitimate claims for damages. That's right. We've said that, that, that we will ignore that cap and that cap is irrelevant for this particular matter. And uh, the cash reserves of the company suggest that you'd be able to do that? 
We believe so. What What are the cash reserves of the company right now? Uh, I don't know the cash reserves of the company right now. Uh, do you have cash on hand? I mean, give me a. Is there a cash number of available cash that you can turn to? I can get back to you on that. I don't know that offhand. All right, I'd like to see that. And uh, what about the uh, the payment of dividend with this kind of exposure out there? Is there a, is a company that revisited the dividend issue at all? I think of a two billion dollar dividend with this kind of unknown exposure. Does that seem like something that the company should be doing right now? Our, our chairman has said publicly that we will, our, our priority is the Gulf Coast and making things right on the Gulf Coast, and, we, and then we will have to balance the, the other uh, uh, components of dividend investment balance sheet. Well, has the chairman said, are the, are the dividends going to be paid or not? That decision has not been made yet. Has not been made yet. So that's still something the company can look at as it looks at the overall financial cost of the cleanup and the civil damages. Is that right? Yes. Second quarter dividend decision has not been made yet. How many uh, U.S. employees does British Petroleum have? About 23,000. What percentage of your overall workforce employee workforce would that be? Uh, Are I mean, there more U.S. employees of, of British Petroleum than any other country? Yes. By quite a bit. By quite a bit? Do you Probably by triple. My mic here or not? But it was uh, one of my one of my phones. I guess too close to the mic. Um, on on this issue of the relief well, Mr. Tillerson, I think you said that it would double the risk of the problem. Then I heard the guy, the person that asked the question, still say didn't understand why we wouldn't be doing this. Why why would you want to double the risk? And maybe you can't answer that since you said you would double the risk. How would this again? Let me ask this one more time. Why would that double? the risk potential rather than provide uh, more secure, more, more safety to the situation? Well, whatever risk exposure you are trying to manage with the exploration well would be the same risk exposure you would be having to manage with the relief well. And does any country require a relief well right now? No. no not one drilled concurrent with the exploratory well. Uh, all right. Which, I'm, I I'm, was, I'm, I'm puzzled. I, the I understand the I think I understand why you double the risk. I also understand when you've got a problem, how you try to get to the source and relieve the pressure. I guess that's what the current BP relief well would do, but I don't understand why anybody thinks that doubling the cost of drilling a well would have any positive impact on, and, and you, you don't believe any other country requires a, a relief well being drilled at the same time? I know, at least in the countries where we operate, no one does. And how, how long, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Watson, how long do you think these platforms can set uh, uh, in the Gulf right now that are not being used? At some point you have to make a decision that even though the well is partially drilled, are they going to allow the partially drilled wells be completed? Or what's your sense of this moratorium idea? Uh, if you're referring to the rigs that we have idled, uh, we uh, have not yet moved these rigs out of the country, but the industry and, and we will respond if it appears that the moratorium is going to extend uh, indefinitely or if, the or if uh, it's, it's not clear when we can put these rigs back in service. They, they can sit for a long time, but uh, the market for deep water rigs is robust right now. Uh, deep water wells are being drilled all over the world. Uh, and developments are taking place uh, around the world, and there is demand for these rigs. And I, I assume if you move these out, it takes some time to move them and takes some time to decide whether you'd ever move them back or not. Would that be a reasonable assumption? Certainly. There are mobilization costs. There are contracts that have to be arranged. There are partner arrangements in the new uh, country or area where it will be drilled. And once it's drilled, the same, those same uh, impediments are in place to moving them back. So. It would, it, would, uh, it would be an issue for uh, development in the Gulf of Mexico if we were to lose those rigs. Ultimately, they can return, but in many cases, they will be put in service elsewhere. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, the Chairman recognizes himself for the next uh, five minutes. Um, first of all, I would just like to thank you all for coming. I am sure there are places you would rather be this morning. Uh, Mr. Watson, looking ahead, I am familiar with some of the investments that Chevron has made in geothermal. Uh, and uh, biofuels. Do you see that becoming a significant portion of your bottom line? And if so, how soon? Uh, right now, 85 percent of the world's energy comes from fossil fuels, and renewables represent a, a small portion oh, of that. Okay. Similarly, for our company, 
although we're the largest renewables producer amongst uh, these companies and other oil companies, thanks to our geothermal operations, I think it will be a long time before uh, all forms of uh, alternate energy uh, represent a significant proportion of, of our bottom line. Now, we do have an energy conservation company that's in place. We do have our geothermal business. We're doing research in biofuels. Okay. And I'm, I'd be delighted to make additional profitable investments in those businesses if they become economic. Okay. Well, I certainly recommend that you follow that path. Um, Mr. Tillerson, in your testimony, you state that an impartial review of events in the Gulf is essential to understand uh, what happened and to prevent its reoccurrence. Uh, given that, do you um, think that the oil industry's failure to adequately prepare for a disaster in the Gulf um, requires enhanced oversight of the industry? Well, I think, the again, the emphasis is on prevention. If you don't have the blowout, you don't have the loss of well control, you don't have the spill uh, catastrophe to have to deal with. Having said that, I think clearly there are going to be a lot of things to learn from now what has been an actual spill of this magnitude, which previously we only had models to, to try to help us understand that. So I do think that Well, the oversight would have to include prevention to make sure that the, correct. the business that's done in the Gulf and in deep water has adequate safeguards built into it and that those safeguards are, are followed, that the regulations are followed. It seems to me that uh, that's a good, a fair question. Do we need government oversight uh, or are the uh, uh, companies going to be able to police themselves uh, at the current level? Well, and I think you need both. There are industry standards and recommended practices that have been put in place, and when those are followed, most, most of these problems are avoided. Having said that, there's also a proper role for regulatory oversight, <clears throat> and the Department of Interior has undertaken an exercise to look for areas where they could enhance the oversight of the industry's practices. And I think the President's Commission, which, has been, which is now being formed to look at this entire uh, incident, both from the standpoint of it, all, it should look both at prevention and response, and I hope ultimately out of that commission. So, we, so we can look we to work know. cooperatively with the industry to to find the right set of of rules and regulations, and that how to make sure that they're properly implemented. Yes, sir. Um, Mr. McKay, uh, all it seems that all the steps to contain the gush seem to have been ineffective, or even made the situation worse. Uh, as we watch oil gushing out on those, those videos, the fail-safe device appears to me in the videos to be breaking apart uh, and oil coming from different parts of the device itself. Is there corrosion involved in this equipment or, or what am I seeing that makes me think that that device is coming apart and, and failing in, in different ways? What, what you're seeing on the videos is that we, we had to t cut the top off of the riser that was damaged and put a cap on top of this uh, lower marine riser package that sits on top of the blowout preventer. Right, and that seems to have made oil gush out from below, that's, which was even... That's because the capacity of our, our system right now to take it up through the uh, riser is, is lower than the total rate of the well, and that's why you see it coming out from around the bottom of that cap. Today, and I haven't gotten an update yet, but today we should have a secondary system producing off of that blowout preventer which may relieve some of that that's coming out around. So you're the saying that oil is not br uh, coming out from inside the, the device itself? No, it's, on t it's the lower marine riser package that sits on top of the blowout preventer. It, it just seems that there's, um, that the device was incapable of, of withstanding the kind of pressure that would be needed from the top to stop it, you know, and it was coming apart. Maybe concrete was coming out or something like that. That's not what I see on the video. No, no. All right, um, I um, yield back, and uh, the next, uh, Mr. Uh, Sullivan, uh, the gentleman from uh, Oklahoma. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate everyone coming today. Um, my first question will be for Mr. McKay. Um, who, who's in the room making the decisions on how to stop this well right now? We have a crisis center in Houston, and it's, it's, we have about 500 people working there, and that includes BP personnel, uh, industry personnel, Coast Guard, Navy, Department of Interior, MMS, um, NOAA, 
USGS, I mean, it's a, it's a unified command system in, in Houston around uh, source control. Is it different than it was a month ago? Um, Today? It's, uh, it's probably got some different participants in the crisis response room I mean, or area. Uh, there's a, there are teams working on flow measurement that are there that are incremental versus a month ago. But in general, the structure is about the same. You think it's working? I think it is. I, I think what's maybe not understood by the American public is that we've had parallel efforts going along all the time to increase capacity, redundancy, and options around killing or containing this well. And those have been worked on from day one, many of them, and some of them take longer than others. So, uh, yeah, I think it is working. I mean, it's unfortunate that we can't put it out, and the frustration is unbelievably high with everybody. But uh, I think everything that can be done is being done. Thank you. And Mr. Tillerson, um, in your testimony, uh, you stated that ExxonMobil has drilled almost 8,000 wells, which I thought was interesting, worldwide over the past 10 years, and that of these, 262 have been in deep water, including 35 in the Gulf of Mexico. Can you discuss what measures your company has taken that have resulted in nearly 8,000 wells being drilled over the past decade without a blowout? Well, it's, I mentioned broadly in terms in my opening statement that it that what we know is that standards and recommended practices that are published. Uh, if you develop good operating procedures, you train the people, you conduct drills, and you use multiple layers of redundancy. And that's not just redundancy in equipment, but it's redundancy in people, eyes and people that are looking at this well as it's being drilled, uh, so that when you are seeing certain things occur in the well that either you don't anticipate or they're telling you that the well is not going according to plan, that you then adjust and manage the change. And a part of our system is a very specific management of change process, that when something's not going to plan, there is a process by which you must go through to deal with that change. And that includes involving peer reviews and multiple layers of people looking at that to ensure that we really are about to, to do the correct thing to maintain the well control and the well integrity. Did anybody, during Hurricane Katrina or Rita, did anybody experience any problems? We, we were extensively impacted during the, uh, the hurricanes and, in fact, uh, learned a great deal from, from those hurricanes and have uh, incorporated those uh, learnings into our uh, response and other capabilities. But as regard to leaking, did any, any spills? Uh, there, there were impacts from toppled platforms, um, so yes. Okay. Well, um, also this is to everybody. Um, can each of you go into the negative impacts of deep water moratorium on U.S. energy production and domestic energy security? How will it affect energy exploration in the outer continental shelf? Uh, where, where will your rigs go? Could it be foreign waters and uh, and uh, and also, could you explain that how we're going to need oil for decades to come, even though we're exploring other technologies of energy? I think the, uh, it's, there's a lot in that question, of course. But the, the fact that we're going to need oil for decades to come is probably the best place to start. And it's simply the scale and the size and the affordability of the energy system overall and understanding what technology, what investment, what government policy and other elements are required to shift that over time. You look at that and you understand the elements of that and you know it will be decades that we'll be using oil and gas. I think that we've, we've addressed to some degree the, the economic impacts and what will happen to the rigs, but clearly these are big, expensive pieces of equipment. Each one, you know, probably has a, an employment surrounding it. Each one of these deep water rigs, it could be up to a thousand people. That piece of equipment needs to find a home where it's working and generating revenue. And that's what those pieces of equipment will do as soon as they can, they can work that out. Anybody else? No. Um, Mr. Mulva, um, in your testimony, you state that the bu business of offshore exploration will and must continue and that we can do it safely and responsibly. Can you elaborate on that? Well, I believe the uh industry has proven that it can be done safely and reliably. From the uh, responses to questions here this morning, I believe that uh, the uh, 
tragedy that has taken place that uh, there's certain less lessons to be learned and uh, and most of us uh, sitting here today would have by our practices and policies would have drilled the well and handled it differently uh, if we look at uh, what this means for natural resources these are indigenous resources for our country and it's very important for energy security that we develop our own resources we can do these in a way that's safely and environmentally and, and responsive way obviously through the incident we've learned that the response to an incident like this is not adequate we'll have to make the changes to do so appropriately but developing our own indigenous resources is so important because it gives us energy security it provides investment and it provides jobs and, and financial resources to, to the states, communities, and the federal government. Thank you very much. And I yield back. <clears throat> gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And <clears throat> following up a substantial line of questioning, I heard the analogy that uh, no one would fly an airplane if we uh, fly, flew an airplane like we drill wells. I would say it's the reverse. After 9-11, we didn't shut down for uh, 60, you know, uh, six months uh, flying on airplanes to find out what happened. Uh, even when there's a terrible airplane crash and a tragedy, uh, we investigate, we come up with findings and fix it, and that's what I'm hoping we'll be able to do. Um, I guess my frustration coming from an oil and gas area is that any time we have a tragedy uh, like this in the energy industry, it hurts uh, areas where I come from. I have literally thousands of constituents who work in the energy industry, oil and gas. I have refineries. I have chemical plants. We still produce uh, in our area, plus I have a lot of constituents who work offshore. So every time a short circuit decision is made, you impact not just the employees of your company uh, and their families, you impact the whole industry. And that's what's frustrating sitting here today. Um, one of the questions, and having been to Norway, and actually I know with the chairman of the committee we were there, and the standards they have, um, it's interesting, I think the last leasing opening, bid opening in the Gulf of Mexico, Statoil from Norway, actually was the biggest bidder on the Gulf of Mexico. And I've asked for many years the difference in production, particularly a Norwegian oil company in the Gulf of Mexico, is compared to Norway off their shore. And uh, that leads up to the uh, question of should we encourage the Department of Interior and Minerals Management to actually uh, regulate uh, in using APIs, cementing requirements? Would that be something that we should do? Because it's a voluntary, I know all of you are members of the American Petroleum Institute, but it's voluntary. Is that something we should do? Although the cementing is one problem we have here, and there's lots of other ones, and those of us who spend a lot of time looking at it, uh, uh, just to answer that question, should we actually make that a regulatory requirement, what the API has, uh, has done as a voluntary? Well, Congressman Green, and, and I responded earlier, uh, short answer to that question. I think the challenge is uh, uh, certainly those standards, I think, have been uh, well designed and they have all the industry input around being a best practice. They could be made a regulatory requirement. I think the the thing that everyone needs to appreciate is uh, in exploration drilling in particular and in certain situations you want to be able to formulate that cement so that it is fit for the purpose that you're using it. And so I think as long as this, the regulation were written to accommodate the fact that, that you want to have the best cementing integrity you can have in that well so it serves its purpose and if conditions change there's not an overly onerous procedure by which you can have a formulation that might have moved outside of that regulation because new new capabilities have been developed. And so I think that's that would be the only concern I would have around it. Well, and my concern is we have a six-month moratorium on deep water. The impact on the, the industries and the people who make a living in the Gulf of Mexico is pretty dramatic. I would hope that would be the, the six months would be the maximum, and we could get some standards in place both for uh, for you to follow, but also for the American people to have some comfort in that the federal government is responding to a disaster that cost 11 lives and, and we still haven't counted up the cost. Um, so would it be better in, to look at what Norway already does in their offshore production? Because I know the testimony earlier you said that they have the strictest offshore standards in, in the world. Uh, would that be better to actually look at the, 
what Norway does. Of course, in the Gulf of Mexico, we're not dealing with cold water. And, uh, and having been to Norway and understand the difference in the high north and what we have in the Gulf of Mexico. But, uh, you know, maybe we ought to look at the toughest standards in the world to produce in the Gulf of Mexico. The reason is because Statoil oil is getting ready to start producing because they leased it. And I, won't, I don't want them to uh, lease in the Gulf of Mexico for less standards than what they have to lease off their own country. Uh, should, we, should we look at what Norway is doing and the success they've had? I could just comment on that. I think the first of all, I just want to make the statement that the industry benefits as a whole from a good, solid set of recommendations. And I think you'd find all of us to be supportive on getting that in place. So to the earlier comment of making sure that the appropriate flexibility to ensure safety is included in those regulations, what you've already seen as a result of this incident is a joint industry task force that got together, including members of API, to say here's a set of recommendations that we would make that could be regulatory changes that we think would make this operation better, safer, more appropriate. So the answer to your question, I believe, is yes. Now, we, it, as we go into those joint industry task forces to develop those recommendations, we bring elements like what's done in Norway and what's done in other parts of the world. We bring that knowledge into that conversation. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have one more question, if I could. In BP, I guess I get frustrated because <clears throat> Uh, I have constituents who work at the Texas City refinery, and I know you've heard it. It's just frustrating. It seems like oftentimes at BP there's been expediency, in this case particularly what we know now and we'll know more as we go, as compared to safety. And we found that out in the Texas City refinery in the loss of 15 lives, that there was decisions made not to fund the safety issue. And actually there was a, uh, a neighbor of mine who lost, uh, uh, who lost his life there at Texas City. It lived in Baytown. So um, I would hope that the problems, whether it be with the pipeline in, in Alaska or any refinery, whether it be in the Midwest or Texas City, Texas, it's close to our district, that you, BP would look at the safety more so than trying to move that rig to another production site. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Florida, Mr. S I'm sorry, the gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Griffith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, some of the childlike, accusatory, mean-spirited, and petulant questioning demonstrates a couple of things uh, in this hearing. One is that it's very, very difficult for us to resist demagoguing this tragedy, and that's unfortunate. The second thing it demonstrates is that there there's really not a lack of natural gas here on Capitol Hill. So uh, <laughs> some of you have uh, been subjected to some things that I think are disrespectful. I do think it's interesting that uh, some were stunned to find out that your disaster responses were similar, almost word for word. You'd be surprised to find that an airline disaster plan is similar from company to company. You'd be surprised to find that chest pain in an ER is similar all over the United States in how we handle it. And the disaster responses to hurricanes and tornadoes are absolutely word for word from municipality to municipality. So that should not have surprised anyone, even, even though it did. With that, I have a, a question for uh, Mr. Watson. Uh, you mentioned something earlier about uh, your company had a stop work policy. What, what exactly is that? A stop work authority is, uh, is really the authority that's vested with each individual employee and contractor to stop work if they see any unsafe condition that jeopardizes health, environment, or safety. And I, I think the important part of the policy that we have in place isn't that, we, isn't that it's written down, because I think many companies have it written down. It's important that it's exercised, and when it's exercised, that the follow-up to that by management is appropriate. Uh, I was in Australia a couple weeks ago, and we recognized a contractor who uh, exercised stop work authority in a lifting operation. Uh, so we routinely recognize people and reward people for using stop, stop work authority. If there are adverse consequences for employees that exercise stop work authority, it ceases to become effective. So we work very hard to not send unintended messages uh, after it is exercised. Thank you. Mr. McKay, uh, the possibility that there's a difference 
d different uh, structure or makeup of the surface oil versus the subsurface oil. Uh, what, what procedures are being done by the Unified Command to uh, determine how best to handle one versus the other? Two pieces. Well, one, obviously, we're trying to contain or we'll stop, and then uh, since that hasn't been successful, contain as much oil subsurface as possible. We get that to the surface and can deal with it. Uh, the oil that's coming out, we're using subsea dispersant, which will uh, dis disperse the oil into tiny droplets and speed biodegradation. What the oil that gets to the surface is being dealt with with skimmers and burning and, and other techniques to try to fight it as far offshore as possible. I would say that the monitoring programs and the measurement programs around sub subsurface uh, oil and dispersant is extensive. Uh, it's shown that the oil concentrations are very low. That's both the data we're conducting under Unified Command as well as independent NOAA data. That's going to be tracked uh, diligently for a long, long time to make sure we understand what's happening. And uh, the natural resources damage assessment that will go into it's being studied now that sets the uh, effectively the restoration plans to damage will key on some of that as well. So that's, that's underway. Thank you. And one more question, Mr. McKay. The Horizon Deep Water was commissioned in what year? Uh, I think 2000. I think okay. 2000. And uh, it's had a record of drilling how many, uh, been involved in drilling of how many wells? Hun over 100 deep water wells. And so uh, this, this was I'm not... Sorry, probably not. A, no, that's the wrong number. I'll have to get back to you on that. This is probably not a, 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 a structure that uh, was flawed or brand new or we were unfamiliar with. No, the, the Transocean rig had been working for us since, since uh, it was commissioned and has been a good rig and has, has operated difficult wells quite well. So it, it could have successfully drilled 70 to... Plus wells. It's drilled a lot of wells, and um, and as I just would like to make one comment, we also have a stop work program, as has been mentioned, and I believe our contractors do as well, and that is a fundamental, important piece of the safety management on a on a rig or an operation like this. I yield back my time, Mr. Chairman. Great. We thank the gentleman. The chair recognizes the general lady from California, Ms. Caps. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. McKay. Last year, you testified before the Natural Resources Committee. It must seem like ages ago. It was before the spill. This is what you had to say about the role of technology and the oil and gas industry, and I quote, the energy industry isn't usually classified as a high-tech business, but it truly is. This technology has been instrumental in protecting the environment. Today's offshore oil drilling technology bears about as much resemblance to what was available in the 1960s as a rotary dial telephone does to an iPhone. That was a very interesting comparison. Let's look at it to get the picture of the contrast. First, we have a picture of a rotary dial phone and then an iPhone. Clearly, there's a difference in technology and we certainly all benefit from those remarkable advances. Now another picture a picture I'm very familiar with, a picture of the boom used in the Santa Barbara oil spill in 1969. That was about the era of the rotary telephone. Now here's a picture of the boom used in the Gulf today, 40 years later. Do you see a big difference between the boom technologies used in these two pictures? I, I don't see a big change in boom technology. There have been tremendous changes in technology and how boom is deployed and how satellite imagery helps deploy resources into the best possible places. Yes, we do have satellite imagery now, but that was the era of the rotary telephone. We now live in the era of the iPhone, and it looks a lot on the shoreline of the Gulf as it looked to me in Santa Barbara in 1969. The two cleanup booms, however they're deployed, they looked and act pretty much the same. Would you agree? That's true, although there are sorbent booms. Well, let me, let me show you another set of pictures. Here's a picture of some workers cleaning up the oil in Santa Barbara in 1969. Now let's look at a picture of a worker mopping up with his own two hands, bare hands, I should add, oil that had reached the Gulf Shore. Again. I don't see a lot of difference in technology between the cleanup in Santa Barbara 
and the cleanup now underway in the Gulf. In fact, I don't see much difference at all. Booms, workers mopping up by hand thousands of barrels of spilled oil. So Mr. McKay, I get that the industry spends a lot of time and effort on exploration and extraction and lobbying. But my problem is that you don't seem to have spent very much on accident prevention or on, and you seem to have made few, if any, real developments in oil spill cleanup. We're talking about 40 years later. So here's my question. What's BP's plan to contain the inevitable accidents from your offshore rigs, the rest of them that are operating out there, which are drilling in even harsher and more difficult conditions? What is it going to look like 10 to 20 or 40 years from now when there's another huge spill to see booms being lined up in the defense uh, for our coast? Is that what we're going to see then? Will we still be relying on thousands of cleanup workers more mopping up beaches by hand? Will that be considered state-of-the-art cleanup technology and response like it is today and like it was 40 years ago? Well, we've talked a lot about prevention today, so I won't go into that. But in terms of spill response, I think one area that we will learn from this incident is the ability to do uh, more subsea intervention. Well, okay. But I, I'm talking about the oil that comes to the surface. Because let me, let me switch to a May 12th Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee and a Trans-Oceans -Doc document. And I quote from that document, the recovery rate of oil under the best circumstances rarely exceeds 15 percent. That's 15 percent of all the, oil that reaches the, uh, all the oil that reaches the surface of the water. It's not a very impressive rate of recovery, but more disturbing is the fact that the rest of the proposed techniques are not particularly effective either. For example, Chevron's, BP's plans, the response plan with the chairman held up earlier, cautioned that some marsh cleanups, cleanup techniques destroy, in this quote, destroy much wildlife and destroy marsh areas. And here's Shell's oil res spill response plan, describing an approach that stands out from the rest. Section 13 of the Shell plan states that oil will accumulate on places like sandbars and barrier islands. The plan states that this can be, and again I quote, very helpful and cost effective as a way of collecting the oil. So Mr. Odom, my final question, does Shell really believe that it is quote, very helpful when oil washes up on barrier islands? Clearly not. And I think the statement is simply meant to go to the fact that in terms of an ability to stop further encroachment and clean up, that, that that's what's intended by the statement. Do you have any other uh, uh, in, information? I, if I had time, I would ask each of you, is this the state of affairs for cleanup today on oil spills? I do think your answer is yes. You're seeing the deployment of the technology today to, re to respond to this bill. Yeah. It, that's the best we can do. Thank you. I yield back. Great. Gentlelady's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Stearns. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, in 2008, Exxon abandoned, um, after spending $180 million, a well called the Blackbeard West. And this occurred when the well's pressure increased to a point that Exxon could not justify the risk of a blowout and decided to put the safety of those workers on the drilling rig and the environment before corporate profits. Perhaps this is what BP should have done. My question is for each of you except Mr. McKay, just answer yes or no. Knowing what we know today in hindsight about the inconsistent well pressure test readings would you have proceeded with withdrawing the drilling fluid from the well? Mr. Tillotson, just yes or no? No. Mr. Watson? Until we see the... Just yes or no? I, I, don't, I can't answer yes or no until we see the full investigation of this report. So you would continue drilling? There are many things... There's only a yes or no here. I'm, only, I'm just asking you, knowing what we do in hindsight, about the inconsistent well pressure test readings, would you have proceeded with withdrawing the drilling fluid from the well? Just yes or no? Based on the information we've seen, no. Okay, Mr. Uh, Mulvall? No. no. And Mr. Odom? No. Okay, let me ask the four of you again. In retrospect now, are there safety measures that your company could have taken to prevent this incident? Mr. Tillerson, yes, yes or no? We haven't had the incident. No, but I mean, in retrospect, knowing what BP did, could you have suggested safety measures that would have prevented this incident? 
they're in the industry standards. They're already there. Okay, so they're already there, and you're saying BP did not follow them. That's at least that's what's been reported. Okay, so in your opinion, there are, and the standards are there, and BP didn't follow them. Okay, Mr. Watson. Based on the information we've seen, yes. Okay, Mr. Mulva. Yes. Mr. Odom. Based on the information, yes. Okay, I think. Mr. Chairman, the majority of opinion here is that BP acted recklessly and should be held accountable for all the economic and environmental damages that have occurred. Now, Mr. McKay, on May 12th you testified when I asked you the question, based upon the worst case scenario, you could handle up to 300,000 barrels a day at 10 miles from the shore. So I asked you what was the rate at that moment on May 12th, and you said it was 5,000 barrels a day. Do you still stand by that 5,000 barrels a day that you gave me on May 12th? Well, obviously that was not right at the, on that day, but that was a unified command estimate. Okay, but you also testified this morning that your estimate went up to 14,000 barrels a day back on May 12th. You said internally BP was talking about 14,000 barrels a day. Is that correct? Uh, not exactly. I said we, we uh, had a range of 1 to 14 that we transferred to. Did you tell command. the unified command that you thought it could be as high as 14,000? Yes, absolutely. And so they went, all of you went with 5,000? They, they chose 5,000. How many there. barrels of, of oil per day are currently flowing from the ruptured well? We don't know. The latest estimate from the flow, uh, flow rate technical group, which is a, a government group, we're not in it, is 20 to 40,000. Okay. And how many barrels per day is the top cap recovering? 15,500. 15, okay. Um, in this case, in retrospect, do you think that because you gave such a low ball, that impacted the response team because they thought it was so low? No, I don't. And Admiral, Ad Admiral Allen has answered this question directly. The response has been geared towards a much higher number. Uh, we've provided every bit of data we can provide as fast as we get it to Unified Command. Um, so so how, how did the estimate go from 5,000 up to what 40,000 even your 14,000 that you estimated May 12th is now at 40,000 how did it get from your estimate high of 14 to 40,000 today well the flow rate technical group which is a government a group of about No I'm asking about BP's estimate cuz well, you're we, saying we we haven't done an estimate since the 1 to 14 it was So you're saying that your corporation has not even attempted to find we, out no, uh, we, we have given our data to the flow rate technical group, which is under direction of Unified Area Command. Their estimate as of a week ago or a week and a half ago was 12 to 19,000. Uh, in the last few days, it's gone 20 to 40. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I just, I just think that BP has low-balled this figure, and I think, uh, and you know what, Mr. McKay, when the buck stop here means, you know, that you take full responsibility. Now, Mr. Markey had asked you for apologize, apology. I really think in light of the performance of you as a CEO and what has occurred, I really think you should be resigning as chairman of BP America. Uh, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's really outrageous that you sit here and tell us that you're going to punt to the unified command when we've had 11 people killed, we've had a huge environmental damage, and you're still sitting here as a CEO of BP Frankly, I would call for your resignation. I'm calling for it for day, today. I'm not asking for an apology. I'm asking you to resign. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the chair recognizes himself for five minutes. Uh, one of the questions that this whole uh, tragedy raises is about America's energy policy. And it's time, I think, for Congress to call the question, does America's energy policy work? Uh, is America's current energy policy sustainable? Uh, the United States, as you know, consumes 25 percent of the world's oil. Uh, we have 2 percent of the proven reserves. Uh, Americans, our businesses and our consumers, uh, spent nearly $900 billion last year, most of that going to countries that are not our friends. And the current policy that we have uh, works well for some, including the shareholders uh, of the companies represented here today. Uh, the, what you do, you do very well, run very efficient operations with the, some uh, tragic exceptions. But profits increased among your five companies uh, from $28 billion in uh, 2002 uh, to $64 billion in uh, 2009. And that's after 
uh, your companies uh, paid dividends that uh, shareholders appreciated of $37 billion. Uh, in Exxon, I believe Mr. Uh, Tilling only has uh, repurchased stock in the value of almost $20 billion. But the, uh, the question for Congress, and I'm going to ask you to comment on this, is whether we're at a point where taxpayers are being well served when taxpayers are continuing to provide subsidies uh, for a business as usual energy policy that's based on a carbon uh, energy 19th century approach versus a clean and renewable energy fuel policy of the 21st century that we need. And the question really is, should taxpayers of the United States continue to provide billions of dollars of subsidies uh, to an industry, the oil industry, that's mature, uh, to an oil industry that's extremely profitable, uh, into an industry that's based on a carbon-based fuel? Or is it time, finally, for the taxpayer incentives that are being steered to the oil industry to be redirected to efforts to develop a 21st century clean energy economy? Mr. Tillotson, my understanding just on a specific uh, tax provision is that Section 199 of the Domestic uh, Manufacturing Deduction provides a tax rate reduction for oil and gas companies. Repealing that would shift $17.3 billion from oil companies and it could be redirected to clean energy efforts, which your company uh, engages in to some extent. Would you support the repeal and redirection of that? No, Congressman, I would not. The Section 199 tax was put in place to preserve and protect manufacturing jobs in the United okay. States. All right. I'm not sure how to explain to a refinery worker why his job isn't any more or less important than an automotive well, worker's job. Th this is not about whose job is important. The jobs that are important are the folks that are down there in the Gulf Coast and are losing their jobs because of this catastrophe that just happened. This is about whether taxpayer subsidies are going to help Americans get jobs in, a, in an energy uh, policy for the future. Uh, Mr. Watson of Chevron, I'll ask you. Uh, my understanding is the tax code uh, right now uh, uh, provides oil and gas companies to expense intangible drilling costs. That costs taxpayers uh, $7.8 billion over 10 years. Do you support continuing that or would you support repealing it or redirecting it uh, to clean energy efforts? I support continuing it and I don't consider it a subsidy. I consider I consider it similar to many other provisions in the tax code that dictate the timing of the deduction. Well, you know, I have one question. I believe in tax incentives, but I question whether they should go to mature industries and industries that are profitable. They've managed to get their sea legs, and your industry enjoyed profits of $68 billion, hard work of a lot of people. But do we need, in America, to be starting to use taxpayer money, which is what these subsidies are, to help us move to a clean energy economy that's sustainable and does not have the risk of these catastrophes that are causing people their lives and their livelihoods. Mr. Marvin, you have a view on this? I do. That I, I, and I think if I go back to where you started, I think it is time for Congress to take a comprehensive review of energy supply to this country. I think part of that would be then, you know, in addition to all the alternatives and renewables that I talked about in my opening okay. statement, I think it would recognize the importance right. of oil and gas and, Mr. and how we make Okay, that thank you. My last question. Uh, Mr. McKay, there was a report by the, uh, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, Mr. Donahue, who said last week that he believed that the taxpayer should help BP pay for the cost of this bill. Uh, BP official testimony is you're going to bear the burden on this. Do you repudiate? the suggestion by the United States Chamber of Commerce that the taxpayer participate in the, uh, the cost of this cleanup? We're going to pay for all costs, all costs of the cleanup. Thank you. Chair recognizes uh, Mr. Whitfield. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, thank you all very much for being with us today. As I've listened to the hearing and your testimony today and articles that I've read in the paper, whether or not they're truthful or not, I don't know, but there are reasons to believe that there were advance warnings given about problems with this particular well. And I say that 
as I, uh, because of all of these things that I've heard, the testimony here, articles I've read, the letter from the chairman of the committee, and when you think that it's alleged that a BP um, employee said that this is a nightmare well, there were concerns expressed by well design, the number of centralizers, uh, the cement process, and so forth. So I would ask you, Mr. McKay, uh, as the president of USBP, were you aware of any of these concerns or problems that existed with this well prior to it blowing? No, I was not. And are, are you aware of anyone on your staff uh, that may have been a, uh, had knowledge of this? I, th I think what the investigations will determine is the interplay between data that was known, decisions that were made, the processes that were followed on the rig, and then the equipment that worked or not. So I th that's part of the investigation. These are, these are big questions. They're important questions. But, but, but from your own personal knowledge, you were no. not aware of any of no. this. Now, when you consider all of the steps that have been taken to try to stop the flow of this oil, uh, the coffer dams, the tie kills, the dispersants, the relief wells, all of these things, and all of you are experts in this field, and we value your views, and if all of these efforts that are being made do not work, is there any way that any of you can guess as to how long this oil might flow? Do any of you have any ideas on how long this could go on? Could, could I just say that the, the, the relief wells that are underway will be, uh, first of all, we're going to try to contain as much as we possibly can. And that's going to increase in capacity, uh, redundancy and resiliency for hurricanes in the next few, three weeks, four weeks. The relief well, first relief well should be down by mid-August, and that should permanently secure this well. Okay, so if the relief well works, then mid-August, that should be the end. And we have redundancy with a second relief well, and should we need it, we can sidetrack, sorry, we can sidetrack both of those wells for other attempts, but we believe that we'll get it mid-August. Because I was reading an article about a well referred to as IXTOC1, which I think was back in 1978 or 79, which was in the Gulf. And evidently in that well, the oil flowed from June of 78 to March of 79. Uh, are any of you familiar with the history of that particular well blowing in the Gulf? Any of you aware of the facts of that? I, I, have, I, I don't have depth of knowledge, but I understand that that was a well in Mexican waters in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, it did go for about nine months. I, I believe it was a jack-up uh, jack and the rig collapsed partially on top of the blowout preventer. It was, it was not a deep water well? No. Okay. But I understand that that well, there was 3.3 million barrels of oil. That's what's reported. Yeah. Okay, well, I yield back the balance of my... Oh, one other question. One other question. Um, I think I know the answer to this because I think you've indicated that you had a policy that any individual or contractor would have the authority to stop the action on the well. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Would, would uh, the gentleman yield? Yes. Uh, Mr. McKay, you said that they, anyone on the, on the rig had that authority. Uh, is there anything that you disagree with in the conclusion and uh, the letter that was uh, sent to uh, that the oversight uh, subcommittee did that uh, that they sent to uh, Mr. Hayward uh, just yesterday talking about the lack of a lockdown sleeve, the failure to circulate drilling mud, no cement bond log, and too few centralizers. Do you quibble with any of the findings in, in this letter? Yeah, I've not been able to go through that letter yet, but what, what I would say is we identified for the ONI subcommittee some of these issues and in our investigation, and what we've said is those all have to be evaluated. And I believe the investigations will get to put this chronology together such that we can understand. Well, let, let me say, if the findings in this letter are accurate, how many folks on the rig had the authority 
to actually stop the work on it? Well, we, Everyone? We, I, was specula Anyone? I was speculating on Transocean, okay, but we had seven people on the rig. Two or three were trainees, so we had four or five people on the rig. That so did all of, so you only had four or five folks on the rig that had the stop work authority? That, those were the sum total of BP employees on that rig. But all of them had the authority to say stop. Every BP stop. employee has that authority. That's right. And did any of them say stop? I, I don't know. I don't know. Because I'm, I'm led to believe uh, that there was at least one BP su supervisor who is uh, taking the fifth. I don't know if that's accurate or not. Uh, is that accurate? I don't think it's perfectly accurate. I think when they were asked him to have a hearing, uh, uh, last month, he, I believe, this is, maybe I shouldn't even say this, but the, I think his attorney advised he wasn't ready and he did, and they could reschedule and I don't know what his Do you know whether he is. actually said stop? I don't know that. You back to Mr. Time. Chairman, I yield my 27 seconds to the right. gentleman from Texas. Uh, Mr. McKay, as your question, I just have to ask you, um, any good interventional radiologist can put a catheter in places that are hard to get to and do kill shots and, and inflate balloons. Has, have, has anyone in your engineering staff looked at the concept of, of putting something down this stem riser and inflating a, a heavy duty balloon just to give you a short period of time to put some cement and, and heavyweight mud on top of it to kill this thing off? Uh, yes, but we have drill pipe that's inside the blowout preventer and, it, and, and it's crimped and, and the tor there's a tortuous path in the blowout preventer it would appear, very tortuous. That was the purpose of the junk shot, was to try to clog up the blowout, pre blowout preventer. But you couldn't stop the flow of stuff coming up. But if you inflated something that rapidly put some compression on the, on the, on the flow below, then you would have a chance to get something on top of it to, to try to get it stopped. I mean, at this point, almost anything's worth a shot. And you got Mike Huckabee on TV the other night. He had a litany of people coming in who wanted to do things to help. This is one of the things that's frustrating us. Mr. Markey's making us watch this thing 24 hours a day on our computer screensavers, and people are coming up with ideas, and there's no place for them to go to get these ideas vetted and, and, and tried. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great. The gentleman from Kentucky's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Gonzalez. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. McKay, it, it's, it's obvious that your colleagues in the industry are saying that what BP did in the way of drilling would not have been the same procedure they would have followed. I believe that's what they, to the person had, or to the witness, have said. Um, why would, it seems like all of y'all are on the same page when it comes to how you contain and clean up, but you're not on the same page when it comes on how to drill. And then your whole theory today is not BPs, is that we would have done it differently, it would have never happened. So I would love to have seen the same uniformity uh, in adopting the, the more safe manner so this would have never happen. Um, so there's a whole lot more to this story, obviously, and it will develop. But Mr. McKay, why would all these individuals have taken different route in the way they would have drilled? Well, I, ca I can't speak for them. But what I can say is part of what these investigations will determine is what were, uh, what were the procedures that were used, the design of the well, the procedures that were used to execute the well and the equipment on the rig and how did it perform and how did decision making and data flow. I think then those will be the design and things like that will be compared to industry norm and we'll see if that's outside of normal or not. And then undoubtedly in an accident of this type and severity, there's going to be a combination, I believe, this is speculative, of decision making uh, uh, processes and equipment that interplay to, to allow this to happen. So I think these questions about what's normal, what's nor not normal, what's unusual, what's not unusual, that's going to come out in the investigations. And to my knowledge, the, the well design is not an unusual design for the Gulf of Mexico. And I realize you have Transocean doing the work, and you've got Halliburton that's basically going to cap after the holes drilled and so on. And I'm sure it's going to be an interesting uh, situation when it's all said and done, because I, I know you're the responsible party under a certain statute, but when it's all said and done, I'm sure that you'll be seeking some indemnification from others. Um, I'm going to ask the other witnesses, and, and just yes or no, it's somewhat rhetorical, can you guarantee to the American public and our constituents that any of your drilling operations 
are free from a similar accident as Deepwater Horizon? And just yes or no, 100 percent assurance, 100 percent. Well, Congressman, I'm not sure we know all, all of the aspects of the Deepwater Horizon incident yet. No, I understand but that. Said, but what we can assure you is that the designs and the procedures and the processes we have in place when carried out yeah. would prevent this from happening. Mr. Tillerson, and, and you know, here's where I want to lead the witnesses. You cannot give 100 percent assurance of anything in our lives. And I think the American public want to hear you guys just come out and say, yep, there's risk. Geez, surprise. There is risk. There are no guarantees in life. That's all I want to know. Yes or no? Can you give me 100 percent so I can go back home? No, I cannot. I believe the Chevron operations are safe. We're drilling deep. 100 percent, sir. No, this is a simple question. And if you guys were in the courtroom, you know what? There'd be a judge saying yes or no. And it's a simple question. I believe our operations are safe. We're drilling deep water. A hundred percent. You can. I can go back and say that your operation, no matter where it is in the Gulf or elsewhere, is a hundred percent safe. That this could never, never replicate itself. I believe our operations are safe. Hundred percent. See, that's what makes it so hard to the American public, gentlemen, for us to go out there and tell them something that they know can't possibly be true. Because it doesn't apply in any other aspect of life or business. I'm a proponent of offshore drilling. I've had this debate with Ms. Capps since the day I got here. Y'all are not making me look good. Can I just go 100 percent? Come on, you guys. I mean, seriously. How can you say yes? But if you want to say yes, say yes. I can I can, say we yes. can all go back. Right, Mr. Chairman? And tell them we had witnesses from leaders in the industry that can actually tell us at 100 percent sure this would never happen again. Congressman, I indicated that we have effective procedures. I didn't No, say no sir, it's, it's say fine. You're saying that it, to me that's 100 percent. I'm, I'm gratified. No, nothing is 100 percent fail safe. Thank you. Not 100 percent safe. It's what we focus on every day, though. The reason I am for exploration domestically is because we depend on more than 60 percent of our oil from foreign sources, which is a national security threat. But we can do it safely. I started off an opening statement that we can explore and produce and do it in a safe way that they're not mutually exclusive. In this country, we have more than a third of all cars and light trucks in the world. It's, by 2020, we probably still will be selling 62 to 70 percent of our cars that will be fueled somehow or operated in part by a fossil-fueled engine. That's why it's so important. But we have an obligation to this country to say that we're going to do it in a safe manner. That's all we're trying to do here. You're the guys that are the experts. You have the resources, the assets, and the knowledge. You're going to have us decide for you if, in fact, you don't really get engaged and so we can go back to the American public and tell them with a straight face that we're doing everything that is humanly possible to make it safe, and if there is an accident, that we can clean it up. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Great. Gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Scalise. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. McKay, I first want to take issue with the statement you made earlier when you said, quote, the spill response has been pretty effective. Uh, I just spent Friday on the ground in Grand Isle, which, as you know, is one of the epicenters of the disaster as it's coming into uh, not only the beaches but the marsh. Uh, they're trying right now to put a plan together to protect Barrieteria Bay, which is an area where uh, they're starting to get oil behind the boom uh, into some of these fragile marshes and ecosystems. Uh, we don't want to sit back and wait until the oil comes in to clean it up, and in, when in some cases you may not be able to clean it up for years. We want to be proactive, and we've been submitting plans. In fact, 75 percent of the plans submitted by our governor to, to have these sand barriers in place still have not been approved. And so when you hear local officials saying they're spending more time fighting BP and the federal government than fighting the oil, that's not what I would classify as, as pretty effective. So please go back and redouble efforts and do everything you can to work with our local leaders who have plans and they're being blocked by BP and the federal government from getting those plans implemented. Uh, that's when it will be effective, is when everything's moving uh, by the speed of light. It takes, right now, at least five days in some cases to get answers on questions. That's unacceptable. So I would appreciate it if you'd look at that. I want to ask you about the relief well. Are you using the same method to drill the relief well as you used for the original 
Horizon well? Well, the, the design of the relief well is, is very, very similar to the original well. Uh, clearly, that, that well failed. It was a miserable failure. You had 11 people die. Uh, are you, you're still using that same method, or have you changed That's the methods been, of drilling? That design has been reviewed over and over with the MMS. Uh, the, the failure of the original well, I think, is going to be a complicated set of decisions, equipment, and processes. Uh, the relief well, I believe, is safe. Well, let me ask you then, on, on the last time you testified, I had asked you about disagreements on the rig. In fact, I had given you uh, a report uh, that you said you hadn't read at the time. Now you've had some time to read it, uh, where there was a disagreement uh, reported in the media uh, between the head of operations on the rig for BP versus the head of operations for Transocean. Uh, did that disagreement occur? Were there disagreements? I believe in the Marine Board hearing uh, a couple weeks ago, that individual from Transocean said that did not occur, that actual individual. Okay, and so we'll, we'll see uh, more, because more reports continue to come out that contradict that, but we'll, we'll see. Uh, I want to go down the line with the rest of the panelists, um, uh, starting with Mr. Tillerson. How deep in the OCS do you currently drill? What's your deepest well? Uh, I think we're talking about water depth. Yes. Uh, we've drilled up to 8,700 feet deep. 87, of course. the. Horizon was 5,000. So you're 8,700. Any incidents there? You know, any blowouts? Any? No. All right, Mr. Watson. I'll have to check on the exact depth. It's deeper than 5,000. Yes. Mr. Mulva. Deeper than 5,000. Mr. Rodham. Deepest approach is 10,000. 10,000. No incidents. No blowouts. And, and so as, as we look at uh, as we look at all of these other. Uh, reports that are coming out, uh, you look at the, re the reaction, it still boggles the mind that, that with the exception, I think, of one of you, the President hasn't talked uh, to those of you who are drilling in deeper water uh, and, and doing it in a safe uh, and effective way uh, with safety as a top priority. Uh, who actually reviews and approves those regional response plans that we heard about earlier? Mr. Tillis. Well, those would be developed in, you're talking about internally. When you all submit those, who do you submit them to for approval? Well, they go to the MMS. So MMS signs off on them. MMS. MMS has to sign off. Mr. Mulva, Mr. Odom. Same. Mr. McKay. Yes, MMS. Now, if MMS, who's the federal regulator, signs off on these, these plans that, by the chairman's own admission, are flawed, why isn't MMS at this table? We have yet to have a hearing with the federal regulator who had an equal role in this disaster. Four of you had absolutely nothing to do with this disaster, and you're here uh, given your time to testify, yet the federal regulator, who's directly responsible for approving these plans, who actually sits there and approves the plan, who approved the inspection of the blowout preventer, still has not testified before this committee. I think there's no excuse for that. If we're really serious about getting to the bottom of this instead of playing politics, we'd have the federal regulator here where we can talk to them about real things that they did to approve these plans that failed us. And that still hasn't happened. Finally, I want to get to the Secretary of Interior's report that came out that actually led to this ban on drilling. And we, we have a copy from a majority of the scientists on the President's uh, own commission that they were using, the Secretary of Interior was using as his basis for banning drilling, actually wrote a letter and came out and said, quote, we believe the report does not justify the moratorium as written. Indeed, an argument can be made that the changes made in the wording are counterproductive to long-term safety. The Secretary should be free to recommend whatever he thinks is correct, but he should not be free to use our names to justify his political decisions. A majority of the members of that commission that the Secretary of Interior and the President are hiding behind for the six-month ban, again, the President's got to stop playing politics and putting politics over science and actually focus on his job under the Oil Pollution Act, which should be directing the response, Mr. McKay. Your job should be paying the bills. The president should be the quarterback on the field. Our local leaders shouldn't have to go to you to get approval to protect the marsh. That's something the president should be directing you to do. That still isn't happening. That's something that needs to change. I would like to uh, ask unanimous consent to submit this for the record, this letter from a majority of those members of the Department of Interior's panel. Without objection, it will be Thank you, and I yield back. in the record. The gentleman's time has expired. Um, uh, for the record, we have had testifying before the committee, uh, the Department of Interior, NOAA, EPA, Coast Guard, uh, and the Would the gentleman uh, yield? Or as well as David Hayes, who is the Deputy Secretary of the Department of Interior. Um, <clears throat> Would the gentleman yield? I'm glad to yield. The only day that we had actual testimony scheduled by 
the secretary of MMS was the day that the secretary was conveniently fired. Uh, why haven't we had an opportunity to reschedule and have MMS come before our committee? They're the ones who signed these reports. They signed those plans. They, they won't give us still the information on the blowout preventer test that was done you on the right BP that, rig. You are right that it was the day that um, that person resigned, but at the same time, the person who did come to substitute was someone who is higher in the uh, high, in the uh, in the um, rankings inside the, of the Department of Interior, David Hayes. So, but doesn't work for that agency. Um, the uh, the chair recognizes a member of the subcommittee, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Engel. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And, and let, let me just say, I, I, I find it incredible that um, some people want to blame the president, the same people who want smaller government and don't want the president to intervene uh, against private industry are the same ones who say that the president should intervene and uh, it should somehow do something. Um, I think tonight we'll hear the president uh, saying uh, a lot of important things and we'll see that he is, is trying to do a, a, a great deal. Um, I, gentlemen, I, I want to um, read some quotes and ask you to comment on it that, that some of you uh, made. Mr. Tillerson, in 2006 you said, and I'm quoting, industry has developed the technologies and acquired the experience to produce these resources safely and with a minimal environmental Im footprint. Mr. Mulva, in 2009 you said, and I quote, our industry, our company, we believe that we have the capability and the experience that we can develop these resources and not in any way really compromise safety and environmental performance. In 2005, David O'Reilly, uh, who was then CEO of Chevron, told Congress that all of the offshore areas closed to oil drilling, quote, can be developed with minimal environmental impacts. And Mr. McKay, in 2009, you told Congress, and I quote, for those who continue to question the safety of offshore energy operations, I can only point to our record in the Gulf of Mexico. Gentlemen, if we can't believe what you said in those days, how can we believe anything you say now and anything you're going to say in the future? I mean, we, we were given assurances that everything would be fine. Uh, I know that accidents happen, but this is one hell of an accident. Um, why should we trust the industry to uh, give us assurances when those assurances apparently mean nothing? I don't know. Anybody have an answer to any of the quotes? Congressman, I stand by my statement with respect to ExxonMobil's performance. Do you believe that uh, industries develop the technologies and acquire the experience to produce these resources safely and with a minimal environmental footprint? When the standards and the processes and the procedures that have been developed by the industry are followed, that has been the case. Well, how can we feel comfortable that those in this, that, that, that the processes and technologies will be followed. Obvi obviously, it wasn't followed here. You asking me or someone yeah, else? Yeah, no, I, I, I'm asking you. We didn't have the problem. I can't answer that. Well, let me, let me ask Mr. McKay. Perhaps he can, he can answer that. The, the tragic accident that has happened here, I think, is going to have a combination of factors which are going to uh, be decisional uh, process and, and, and equipment. The investigations are exceptionally important to understand how that chronology works and what caused this accident. I do have confidence that we will understand what happened here. I do have strong confidence in that. I also believe that there will be improvements made because of those learnings such that the industry can get back to work. And I think that can happen pretty quickly. M M Mr. McKay, let, let me ask you this. What really infuriates the American people, what infuriates me is after the accident, every single day it seemed that BP was trying another technique, uh, another method of trying to plug the hole, and each time it failed. It, it, it's mind-boggling for, for, for me or for, for anyone else to understand why there were not uh, safeguards in place, technologies in place. Um, modes of operation in place so that if a disaster happened, you would know, know immediately what to do. This, unfortunately, this particular incident occurred where the lower marine riser package did not disconnect from the blowout preventer, so we have a package on top of that preventer. We had 4,300 feet of riser off the top of that, kinked, and 
the the access to that to be able to do anything from the top on that blowout preventer has been prevented. But that never uh, occurred to anyone beforehand that that might happen. Uh, not in that way. I don't think anyone could predict that. That that package is supposed to release from that blowout preventer, and it has not. Well, doesn't this mean that oil drilling is inherently risky? There's risk, as as was mentioned a few moments ago. There's risk in everything, but I do think the the systems and the technology that uh, that is available to the industry and will be improved through the learnings here the resources, the important resources here can be developed. Why are these disasters seeming to only happen in uh, the U.S.? We had the Exxon Valdez 20 years ago and now we have this. There's drilling all around the world in the North Sea, all over. We don't hear about uh, tragedies like this. Uh, are the oil companies in, 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 in the United States cutting corners? No, I, I would say unfortunately there are tragedies around the world. There, the, probably the worst rig disaster in history was in the North Sea. Um, so unfortunately these things happen around the world and we have to improve from each and every one of them. And I think that's what the industry tries to do. Well, so does, doesn't it prove my point that oil drilling is inherently risky? There could always be a disaster? No, I don't think always. I think that the track record overall in the industry is very strong, but we have these, we have issues like we've had this tragic accident that we've got to learn from. Well, I don't hear anybody saying drill baby drill anymore and for good reason. I, I just think it's, it's just absolutely um, ridiculous uh, that uh, this could happen and that there's no uh, response that's uh, satisfactory. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great. The gentleman's uh, time has expired. We now turn and recognize a member of the full committee, the gentleman from uh, Mr. McKay, I, I wonder if we're all on this panel not saying essentially the same thing. And that is that BP shouldn't be in charge of anything in this operation anymore. That Mr. Scalise and many on our side have said in different ways there's very little credibility that, is con that BP has in telling us what's going on. The numbers have been wildly underestimated, as Mr. Markey's questions earlier pointed out. It is pretty clear that you're conflicted when it comes to settling claims with people who have been victimized by your negligence. You don't want to pay. You want to pay less. Do they want to get more? It seems that your control over the access of the media to the location, you're conflicted. You want to portray this in a certain way. Members of the media want to try to find out whether you're telling them the truth or not. And that even people who have expressed frustration with the president basically are saying, why do you trust these guys to do anything? You should get in there and do it yourself. And I think that it comes down to this basic notion that was reinforced today when the four gentlemen to your right basically said that a well-managed company that was doing things responsibly wouldn't have had this problem because they would have taken the information that Mr. Waxman and Mr. Stupak released yesterday. They looked at it and said clearly that corners were cut and that there's no credibility in, what, in, in even the basic elements of how this thing was done. And I wonder what you would say to the American people who open up the newspaper and say, well, BP says dot, 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 why any of it should be believed. Like, what have you done to establish any level of credibility here? Even your supporters, even the people who will go to their political ends saying, drill, baby, drill, even they're saying, hey, the president is responsible because he trusted those knuckleheads at BP. I mean, I don't understand why on any level going forward, you all should be in charge of anything. So let's go one by one. Why should the claims process be under any control of British Petroleum? Why shouldn't we just take the money that, that, that is going to be paid out in claims in the billions of dollars and give it to someone independent of BP to say which claim is legitimate, which one is not? Why should BP have it in their control at all over what claims they pay? We have, we have been very clear from the start we're going to pay all legitimate claims, so that's point one. Point two is we've set up a claims network. Who do you think should determine who's legitimate? Uh, we're following OPA guidelines under OPA 90. Do you believe that BP is conflicted in all in deciding whether or not BP should pay money that BP is going to have to pay to victims? Do you think you're conflicted at all? Um, not, no, not entirely. You know, I think that walks the line actually being a rhetorical question. You're clearly you're clearly conflicted. Let me ask you about access to the media or experts on trying to learn what's really going on there. Now, there have been some reports that in the process of trying to get access, 
you had to check, a member of the media would have to check with BP whether to get access to the largest environmental disaster ever created by BP. Now, do you think that you're conflicted at all in having any decision-making role at all about whether BP should be able to give access to, a, to an environmental disaster created by BP? Well, I'm not familiar with the protocol for access. That goes through unified command. So, so under no circumstance should any member of the media or any expert who wants to try to get the information themselves ever have to call BP to get clearance to do it? No, I didn't say that because they may be acting under instructions of unified command. So I don't know. What I'm saying is I don't know the protocol. But for whether access. someone someone somewhere thinks that you should have that is not the question I'm trying to get into now. What I'm trying to understand is whether under any circumstance anywhere in the decision tree should be anyone who has been so horrible at making decisions. I mean, the one thing we know from this hearing with, with metaphysical certitude is that BP created this problem through their own negligence, through their own cost cutting, through their own corner cutting, and it's not just someone like me who believes that we should be reducing the amount of drilling that we're doing. It's the, the gentleman to your right who believe you should be doing more of it, and even they say you've done that. So the question is, in this entire context, why should the American people, at any time when it says BP says dot, 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 not immediately take up the newspaper and throw it over their shoulder because there's no credibility on it? And if we don't believe that there's credibility, why is there any decision making left in your hands? And I think, Mr. Chairman, you know, what, what we have here is that there are opportunities now for us to, to not remake the same mistake over and over again. If we know they're conflicted about being truthful with information, any access to the media, any access of experts to the American people to what's going on there should not go through BP. If we know they're conflicted about wanting to understate costs, that's the basic element of a corporation wants to take in as much as they can, give out as little as they can, why is there any role to play in claims? And then becomes, why should there be any decision-making ability on your part at all here? And that's one thing my Republican friends who want to criticize the administration for not doing enough, maybe we agree. Maybe we do need to have BP involved in a heck of a lot less anything to do with our environment, anything to do with our citizens going forward. Because while you're sitting here saying over and over again that we are going to play all legitimate claims, my question is who determines legitimate? And I think it should be the American people, not you. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. Um, by unanimous consent, we are going to recognize two members who are not on the committee, uh, but who represent. Uh, of the Gulf of Mexico. We'll begin by recognizing the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Gao. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Mr. Chairman, the um, oil disaster um, has caused uh, great economic impact uh, to my district. Uh, hundreds of businesses have closed and thousands out of work. Uh, Mr. Stern uh, asked Mr. McKay to resign. Well, in the Asian culture, we do uh, things differently. You know, during the samurai days, we just give you a knife and uh, ask you to uh, commit harakiri. Uh, my constituents are still debating on what they want me to ask you to do. But uh, with that being said, the cleaning up process has been a disgrace. The claims process has been dismal. And one week, uh, into the oil spill, I approached BP about establishing a trust account, and I received no response. Now that the President is asking you to uh, establish an escrow account, what would be your response? I don't think any decisions have been made on a, on a trust account. We've been clear, as I said, that we're going to pay all legitimate claims, and we're, the whole company is standing behind that. So a decision on whether to do a trust fund or account I don't believe has been made yet. I've been approached by hundreds of uh, constituents who said I am legitimate and BP is saying that I'm not legitimate. How do you respond to them? I, I, don't, I don't understand the, the, the individual claims. I mean, if the claims have been submitted, then they, have they been rejected? Well, they have not been rejected, but they've been delayed. And, and, and people, when their livelihoods are on, on the line, they cannot afford to be delayed. I, I can't answer the question. I know that if, if there are issues with claims that we should talk about offline, we, I'd be glad to do that and get our claims experts to, to come see you and try to understand those claims. Now, uh, I, I want to ask a question uh, to the panel because um, the moratorium is, a, is affecting uh, Louisiana in a, in a very uh, tremendous way. And I'd like to ask you, um, 
do you have the technology to know exactly where uh, the oil reservoir is? Do you have the, the technology to know that? In other words, do you know how deep you have to drill before you tap into an oil reservoir? Well, yeah, let me just say to a, high de to a reasonably high degree of accuracy, yes. So through what, 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 data, what would be reasonable, 90 percent, 95 percent? You know, I'd, I'd actually have to get an expert to tell you in the Gulf of Mexico how many feet above or below would be the, uh, the air range, but it's pretty close. Uh, but generally, what risk, what risk exists if you were to drill a well partially? Would there be any risk involving that in not tapping into the reservoir? Would that would there be tremendous risk, minimal risk? Do you is there is is there a risk of having a uh, a a blowout like we did with the Deepwater Horizon? Congressman, I, I, in response to an earlier question. I commented that most of the well control, the, a lot of the well control issues and blowouts have occurred prior to ever reaching the objective. Uh, shallow gas hazards, uh, overpressured saltwater zones can lead to well control problems. The difference is you would not be having a lot of oil spilling out of the well, but you would still have a blowout condition. You might have natural gas coming out instead. So yeah. there, there's risk. Uh, there, it's, a, it's a risk management process to drill the well to the objective. Now, if I were, uh, in order to, uh, I guess, uh, to address uh, two concerns. One, the administrations need to have additional time to implement safety procedures and protocol. But on the other hand, I'm facing the prospect of losing thousands of jobs in Louisiana because of the moratorium. Would allowing companies to drill partially and not allowing them to tap into the oil reservoir, would that create tremendous risk? The reason why I'm looking into this possible uh, uh, solution is to, on the one hand, allow the administration the time to do all the safety checks, but at the same time trying to keep the rigs in from not going anyplace else, because there is at this present moment, a high demand for these rigs. Is that correct? We've seen a, I, I've seen a proposal by Senator Landrieu to allow uh, certain drilling operations to take place. Uh, and we think it is important to put uh, the industry back to work. Uh, as we said earlier, the industry, through the Joint Industry Task Force, has made recommendations, and the Department of the Interior has made uh, recommendations to uh, uh, that can be employed. Uh, one of the things that I would comment on is as we raise standards, it's important that the MMS be adequately staffed to approve uh, uh, revised permitting uh, procedures that are being put in place. Thank you, Dan. You're back. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, the gentlelady from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee, is recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your courtesies. So many of us, as the Chairman has indicated, uh, come from the region where so many constituents are impacted every single day by the conditions that we now face. Reminded that in the Gulf area, we consider ourselves family. Uh, so many of my constituents are somewhere or another related to the energy industry. The gentlemen that sit before me really have a major opportunity that I think has been characterized by my colleagues who have questioned you today. There is certainly a high degree of mistrust by the American people. Although after 9-11 and the horrific tragedy and terrorist act, Americans did get back on airplanes and seemed to buy into the fact that this was part of the American life. I think you have a major challenge uh, because uh, you are looked upon in a distance. Maybe we know you somewhat in our local communities, but most of America has no stake uh, in the energy industry. They don't know you. Uh, most of the discussion on national energy policy is a divided discussion. Your lobbyists uh, appeal to those on the other side of the aisle when they think it is appropriate, and they castigate uh, some of us on the other side of the aisle. So I'd like to raise the question of really making the discussion of the national energy policy an American discussion, where we're not characterized from region 
uh, what uh, political party we're from, what ethnic background we're from, but we really come together and begin to assess how can we restore the faith uh, to the American people that this is an industry uh, that is part of our national security. You failed. You have patently failed. You don't know us and you don't want to know us. And so I'd ask this question very quickly. The main uh, visual that is being shown uh, shows the oil in the water. And my question would be to each individual here, what would be your willingness of an investment in an R&D fund that would address immediately the question and long term of this question of oil in the water. The oil in the water now, beyond the explosion uh, and the tragic loss of life, and let me stop for a moment again, having met some of the victims' families, to offer again my deepest sympathy, as I did uh, during the Texas City incident when some of my constituents uh, were working there. But what is the investment that you'd be willing to make on R&D on this question of oil in the water? Can I quickly ask Mr. Tillerson, and because my time is short, um, to go down the, the line and uh, in an answer. Well, uh, Congresswoman, there is a, there is, we already spend money. There are academic studies underway. There are government funded studies underway. And I think something that the Presidential Commission should consider is an accumulation of what all currently is underway in the area of oil spill research and containment and cleanup and see if that's really being spent on the right things. And the Commission, I think, could play a useful role and accumulating that and determining whether that research needs to be better focused based on what we learned from this incident. Thank you. Because my time is short, why don't I just say, would you be willing uh, to have a fund set aside for R&D, just yes or no? We are willing to participate, yes. Thank you. Smova. Absolutely willing to participate. Mr. Yes. We've yeah. announced that we're doing a fund, $500 million. All right. On exactly yes or no as to the willingness of the industry to come together uh, and to des design expanded and more detailed and more technically sophisticated uh, recovery plans. Uh, Mr. Tillerson, yes or no? I think based on what we learned from this, we will all want to do that. Mr. Just go down the line. Thank you. Yes. 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 Um, there is a, a cap on uh, liability, and of course there are a number of legislative initiatives that are moving forward to remove the cap. I want to know whether the industry would support the removal of that cap long-standing. Mr. McKay? We've, we've said, I haven't looked at all the policy around the different bills and ideas, but we've said for this incident, for us, we were, that cap is irrelevant. May I have all the? I do think it's time to relook at the whole program. Don't have a proposal on the cap. Yes, I think we should uh, look at uh, considering raising it, but we need to do it in a way with informed judgment. We need to look at raising it in a way that will make it compatible with uh, the appropriate amount of development that, that the Congress and the administration desire. Yeah, I think based on the incident, the whole question of the oil spill liability trust fund needs to be revisited. And I think we want to understand, so what is the purpose of that trust fund? And therein would give us some guidance on how to set that cap. Thank you. Uh, Mr. McCain, just very quickly, there is emails in uh, our materials that uh, call the well a crazy well. Uh, someone else uh, making comments about that they were nervous. There is a problem with the claims process, and I think you have to own up that it does not work. I'm asking you, uh, Mr. McKay will be, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Haywood will be before the committee. Quickly, will you please answer the establishment of a separate claims process escrowed to be able to make determinations? I don't think you can make determinations on what is legitimate. Oystermen and others and restaurants are all in shambles. Would you accede to that? Would your company consider that a separate claims process from BP? What we've said is we're going to get an, uh, an independent mediator to help us, and we are looking at other suggestions to improve it. I can't say yes or no. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't think that will work. I think we are dying in the Gulf. Beyond getting back to this issue of the moratorium, you have companies and restaurants that are shut down and people losing their jobs. You've got to improve the claim system, and you need to move now. Thank you. Great. General Lady's time has expired. Um, chair makes a unanimous consent request to allow all members of the committee to submit, submit uh, questions for the record uh, without objection so ordered. Um, this has been um, an historic hearing, um, but uh, we are in an historic time. This 
is the single worst environmental disaster in our country's history. And the American people want to know how it happened, why the response is so inadequate, and what we are going to have to do in order to ensure that it never happens again. Uh, that is why the attention of the American people is riveted uh, on um, this issue. And you gentlemen, who are the CEOs of the um, largest oil companies uh, in our country. Mr. Tillotson said that uh, you are not well equipped to deal with these sorts of spills. Uh, with all of the billions of dollars you make, you apparently can't afford the experts who can tell you collectively that walruses and seals don't live in the Gulf of Mexico, let alone the experts who can tell you how to prevent, respond to, and stop this leak. BP holds 37 leases in the Gulf of Mexico on which it drills for free. ExxonMobil has 14. Chevron has 51. Shell has 28. And ConocoPhillips has 10. Between you all, that makes 140 leases on which you pay zero, not a, pen, not a penny in royalties to the American people or to the people of the Gulf for the right to drill for oil and reap billions upon billions of dollars in profits. Yet, when you're asked, can you stop the massive quantities of oil that are now ruining the beaches and marshland, killing the wildlife and devastating the economy, you say no. You say you're not well equipped to deal with it, and these catastrophic uh, impacts are simply unavoidable. That is unacceptable to the people in the Gulf of Mexico. It is unacceptable to the people of our country. For years, you've gotten a free ride on some of your offshore drilling, which amounts to $50 billion in royalties not paid over the lifetime of these leases. At the same time, when your free ride results in a major disaster, what we have seen today is the collective uh, answer that we cannot effectively deal uh, with uh, the consequences uh, of uh, a geyser coming from the bottom of the ocean. It is an embarrassment that your response plans are about seals and walruses and contain long disconnected phone numbers for long deceased experts. It is an embarrassment uh, that of your billions of dollars you have spent uh, less than one-tenth of one percent on the development of safer technologies. Your industry needs to step up to the plate and recognize the need for change. You need to change your emergency response plans. You need to strengthen your safety measures. You need to invest more in new safety uh, response and alternative energy technologies. Uh, you, Mr. McKay, you must ensure that there is an independent capacity uh, to guarantee that every claim is not going to be determined to be legitimate or not by the chief counsel of BP. There has to be an independent evaluation to ensure that legitimate claims are determined not by your own self-interest, but by, in fact, an independent uh, arbiter to ensure that these people are not uh, harmed beyond uh, that which they already have. This disaster is a wake-up call for your industry. Uh, you need to heed this call. You need to bring to the table the plans uh, that ensure uh, that uh, this never happens again, that we never see a response like this again. Uh, and we are going to be moving legislation uh, that will accomplish that goal. It would be better, however, if the industry was saying, we understand now it just can't be voluntary. It has to be mandatory. These safety features, these response features, they have to be mandatory. We cannot any longer rely upon the voluntary. We see what the consequences are for the people of the Gulf and our country. This hearing Mr. Uh, is Chairman. adjourned. Thank you. And this hearing is adjourned. And just we This hearing is uh, adjourned, and we would ask the, uh, the
please, please uh, ensure that the disruption is taken outside of this uh, room. Thank you.